Welcome everyone to the uh, board meeting today for the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. Uh, my name is Jeff Hales and I'm, I'm chair of the Standards Board. Um, uh, before we get into uh, the meeting, I just wanna cover a few basics. One, uh, you know, today's meeting is going to uh, be recorded and so uh, it'll be available on our archive uh, on our website. Um, and while you're there, uh, if you look uh, at where the, uh, the Standards Board calendar is, you'll see um, a number of links for the agenda for today's meeting. Uh, as well as the slides. Um, and uh, as many of you have participated in, in these, or you know, listened to these meetings before, uh, you'll know that the, these, these meetings are, are meant to be a, a public view into the, to the uh, deliberations of the standards board, but they're not an interactive meeting with the public per se. Uh, that said, uh, while there's not an opportunity for us to engage in Q&A during the meeting with, with those who are viewing it, uh, those who are uh, observing it and have questions, whether it's in real time or, or later, are encouraged to go ahead and, and submit questions. Uh, what, one way you can do that, of course, is uh, you can always do that is through our standards, uh, through, through SASB's website where we have a, a public feedback page and, uh, and we welcome your comments and questions. So uh, with that, I'll go ahead and uh, move to the next slide and we can uh, meet the, the standards board who is here with us today. So um, we could to the next slide. There we go. Uh, great. So uh, as I mentioned, I'm Jeff Hales, chair of the Standards Board, and uh, uh, I've got my uh, 10 other board members um, uh, listed here. And so we'll go ahead and uh, check in with each of them to make sure that they're uh, able to, to speak and we can see them. So we'll start with uh, uh, one of the vice uh, co-vice chairs, uh, Verity Chagar. Verity. Welcome. Hi, Jeff, and everyone. Nice to be with you today. Thank you, Verity. Uh, Bob Hurth, are you there? Yes, I am, Jeff. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Kurt. Yes, a little slow on the drawer of the draw, but uh, ready and ready to go, Jeff. We know you're quick with wit, wit with wit, and uh, and with insights. So it's okay if you're a little slow on the technology. Um, uh, Lloyd Kurtz, I think, might be uh, joining us a little bit late, and so uh, uh, we will wait for him. Uh, Dan Geltzer, are you there? Uh, yes, I, I'm here. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, all. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Elizabeth Seeger. I think this is working. Hi, everybody. Hi, Jeff. It is working. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, Mark Siegel. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Mark. Uh, and we're going to actually skip Suzanne for a moment and go directly to Stephanie. Stephanie Tang, are you there? Good morning, hello everyone, and happy to be here. Hi, Stephanie. Uh, and then uh, we're saving for the, the last two introductions, um, two of our, our newest board members. And so uh, uh, the first of those two is, is Suzanne Stormer. And so I'll ask Suzanne to say hello, and then we'll go to Mark Fasten. Uh, and I'd like to actually give them each an opportunity to just uh, introduce themselves uh, for those who uh, haven't yet had the opportunity to learn a little bit about them and their career. So Suzanne, we'll start with you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you for the welcome. And uh, I would say good afternoon. I'm based in Copenhagen, Denmark. And uh, I was actually with Novo Nordisk when we started conversations about me joining. And in that capacity, I've been so fortunate to be able to work with SASB for many, many years. We were part of developing the very first sector-specific uh, guidance in healthcare. Uh, no one orders being a healthcare company. And uh, then I have stayed uh, uh, and remained uh, a very strong supporter of, uh, of SASB since. I am now, as will appear from the byline, uh, a partner heading up sustainability with PwC Denmark. And I will do what I can to help uh, spread the gospel of what SASB can do to really help raise the quality of, uh, of sustainability reporting and make it more meaningful. Uh, maybe as a final point, uh, I've been part of the um, working group set down by EFRAG in the EU to, uh, to, to come with uh, recommendations for what could be European standards, um, and I have been very active in the reporting space, 
leading Novo Nordisk's integrated reporting and also as a member of the IIRC Council. Um, so integrated reporting and value creation um, and potential destruction are very close to my heart. So thank you very much for having me here. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, really appreciate everything that you're bringing to the board, and uh, you know, I followed the work that you had done at Novo Nordisk, and of course, you know, we've we've been on. Uh, I think our first panel together was was years ago, but uh, uh, great to now have you uh, uh, in a different capacity uh, on a, uh, here with us today. So. Wonderful. Thank you for, for being part of SASB's efforts. Uh, and uh, now we'll go to Mark. Uh, Mark, hello. Yeah, th thank you, uh, Jeff, and uh, thank you for having me. My name uh, is, uh, is Mark Fassen. I'm really uh, delighted uh, to, be, uh, to be here in my, in my first uh, SASB meeting. I'm also saying good afternoon because I'm, uh, I'm based in, in Amsterdam. So also Europe based. Um, I'm a partner at, uh, at KPMG, where I'm at the moment uh, heading up our, our national office uh, for the, uh, the audit practice. Um, but I have a, a large, a long history in dealing with financial reporting, having been the, uh, the firm's global IFRS leader for more than 20 years, where I was based in, uh, in London and uh, uh, had a lot of interaction, obviously, over the years as the, uh, the ISB developed uh, since 2001 uh, up to where it is now. So that's the, the background. And uh, um, in my uh, current capacity, I'm also still leading internationally for KPMG or network of uh, uh, better business reporting. So these are all the people that are dealing in the field with integrated reporting and also with sustainability reporting. So that I've been doing for the last few years. Um, and um, maybe to also good to mention, similar to Suzanne, I am quite close to European developments uh, for many years. I'm uh, the deputy president of Accountancy Europe, which is the, the trade body for the audit profession in Europe. And uh, in, in that capacity, I have a lot of interaction also with the European Commission and with ESMA and other European stakeholders. Um, and I'm on the board of, of EFREC, uh, the, uh, the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group that uh, is at the moment talking about taking on a role on, uh, on corporate reporting for, for Europe, as, uh, as Suzanne was mentioning. So I'm really looking forward to the interaction with my fellow board members and with, uh, with the staff. And what I would hope to bring is uh, my experience in, in standard setting. Uh, the interaction between uh, sustainability reporting and financial reporting and uh, just generally uh, I think uh, a lot of uh, uh, experience in international in the international reporting landscape so I hope that I can bring an international perspective to uh, to the board we really look forward to it great thank you mark uh, we're, we're super excited to have you uh, on the board and uh, you know I don't know how you and, and Suzanne do it you certainly like uh, I guess so many of us are are, are busy but uh, I appreciate the all, all the enthusiasm you bring um, and uh, and that you can find some time to to contribute to the the effort that we're engaged in here so uh, thank you thank you for being here great uh, so um, with that actually we'll just um, I'll also call on Lloyd Kurtz who I believe now is uh, is, is able to join with us uh, Lloyd are you there great how's it going it's good. Thanks. Thanks for being here, Lloyd. Uh, so that is that is our standards board, and then um, of course throughout uh, the the session today, we'll be joined by some of the the research staff uh, at SASB as well. So um, great. Why don't we go ahead and look at the topics for today? So um, we as we, we have four topics, and as we normally do in our standards board meetings, we're going to start with a general update of things that are happening and of relevance to the organization, uh, and then we'll. Uh, go into our standard setting uh, agenda and look at, uh, well, we have many projects that are ongoing, uh, a lot of uh, effort continually taking place um, kind of behind the scenes. We will um, be, be getting an overview of some of that and, uh, 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 and then uh, we'll be diving deeper into a few specific of, uh, projects that uh, we have uh, on, on um, the agenda for today. So, um, after we go through an overview of the pipeline, we'll talk uh, in a little more detail around the human capital uh, research project in particular, as there's been some, some recent developments there that we think it's a good opportunity to give the, the board uh, and the public an update on. Um, and then uh, that's, that will all be in our first uh, half or so of the, of the agenda for the day. In the second main session, we will dive into a, a deeper discussion around a couple of particular projects. One. Um, relates to our the work on our governance documents, the conceptual framework, and our rules of procedure, and uh, and there 
uh, this will really be one of the first opportunities that we've had to to hear back on the public comment letters on the work that we've been doing in those projects and so um, really just the first step in in starting to process the the feedback that we received as, as part of the, the public comment period but the really important part of our process and looking forward to uh, hearing uh, about the comment letters and engaging in some discussion and education around that and then we will uh, uh, be turning to the infrastructure sector sector where uh, um, we'll be talking about some some um, opportunities to potentially improve the standards and, and looking at uh, uh, some of the work that that goes on in in the development of of, uh, of a pipeline of potential work to, to to you know find opportunities to improve the standards and and address uh, comments or, or feedback that we've gotten on them so uh, we're looking forward to that uh, discussion as well and then we will wrap uh, at about uh, 11 30 um, pacific time so uh, with that uh, why don't we go ahead and uh, jump into uh, the first topic for the day which will be to do our standard setting agenda overview and uh, uh, david parham is here to lead that uh, for us he's the director of research projects uh, so david welcome great um hi jeff thanks uh, excited to join everyone today as uh, you just mentioned, Jeff, I'll focus on providing us with a, a relatively quick overview of our portfolio of projects, um, try to touch on some, some key updates on projects that aren't on today's agenda uh, to keep the board and the public apprised on our, our progress on multiple fronts. Um, and then, as mentioned, Jeff, I'll provide a few key updates on some developments in the field that are, are relevant for our work. Um, really look forward to any questions or discussion um, with the board related to our ongoing standards development work. Lots of activity going on across the team and of course happy to dive into any of these areas in additional depth if it would be helpful to the board. So let's go ahead and jump in. Um, and let's take a look at the current set of projects that we're actively advancing. So uh, first, just wanted to orient us on this slide um, and sort of the infographic that you see here. This is uh, sort of a visual depiction of our standard setting process as described in our rules of procedure. So if we start on the left-hand side, um, you can see a number of our projects that are sort of clustered in this um, early phase research issues monitoring um, side of our work. And, and of course, um, those research projects really help us to understand, identify, and assess potential standard setting opportunities. As we move to the middle of the slide, you can observe projects that are moving uh, through our standard setting process, including our preliminary deliberations, evidence gathering, consultations, and so on, moving towards uh, proposing standards updates and ultimately initiating public comment periods. Um, afterwards, uh, we of course take the result of those public comment period into deliberation um, and move towards um, issuing a standards update uh, where appropriate. So. Um, as you can see, we have a range of projects across this spectrum, and I'll briefly take a few moments um, to touch on the early side of this pipeline, uh, really focusing in on our research projects um, in, in my next comments here on this slide. Now, in terms of what we have circled here in red, those are the items that Jeff just shared that are on the agenda for today. Um, so, of course, uh, in that issues monitoring um, bucket, we have the session that we'll have with Will who has done a tremendous amount of work um, within the infrastructure sector, identifying, doing that early phase research and identifying potential standard setting opportunities um, related to the sector. So Will's uh, prepared uh, quite a bit of materials to help dive in to the, with the board and identify what some of those priority areas will be to help uh, carry forward and initiate work in that area. Uh, also here, as Jeff mentioned, we'll be um, getting an update from Kelly on our ongoing efforts uh, around our human capital research project. So definitely won't uh, steal her content and let her provide the deep dive on uh, some of what we heard in our recently concluded open consultation period, as well as uh, what we're planning uh, for next steps throughout the year. I just wanna remind uh, the board and the public, this, is, uh, this project really remains a top priority for our team and for the organization. It's going to be a key focus for us this year, um, so lots more to come on this project throughout the year. And then third on the right-hand side, um, we have the discussion that Jeff mentioned on our key governance documents, our conceptual framework, and our rules of procedure. Um, really looking forward to the discussion where we can dive into uh, some of what we heard during the recently concluded public comment period and, and implications for our forward work in those areas. But let's turn our attention to 
the research, other research projects um, that are um, shown here on the left-hand side of the screen, and I'll just touch on each briefly, um, given these items aren't on the agenda for today, but some, some key updates related to them um, that I thought I'd share with the board. So if we look uh, to our internationalization efforts, um, this is a project that's focusing on uh, identifying and addressing um, instances in the standards where there may be metrics, topics, technical protocols um, that are not internationally applicable and seeking to address those instances um, to ensure that the standards are uh, globally applicable and able to be used in an international context. So this is going to be a big priority for us this year as well. Um, the board may recall last year we invested significant time and effort to holistically analyze really every topic, metric, and technical protocol across all of our different industry standards to identify instances where we have uh, references or constructions of the standard that may impede their ability to be used effectively in an international context. And once we had identified those areas, we did a significant amount of analysis, market engagement, uh, really to better understand these instances and help us define approaches for how we will be able to resolve those issues. So this year, really where we're looking to advance this work is by um, focusing on identifying specific projects that we can initiate coming out of that foundational research work, which we completed last year. So, just to, to let the board know that um, you can anticipate us bringing forward recommendations this year um, from the staff based on that foundational research work to help us meaningfully advance our internationalization efforts this year. So big focus for us. Um, moving down the list on the left-hand side there, the next project you see is our content moderation project. Um, board members may recall um, last year, based on that research project and that extensive research work, the staff proposed a standard setting project focused on content governance in the internet media and services industry. Um, we're thankful to receive the board's approval to move forward with that project. Um, uh, related to the research project here, we did publish a comprehensive taxonomy document that presents the results of that extensive research work. You can find that on our website associated with the project page. Um, and I'll focus a bit more on the standard setting efforts uh, in the next slide, um, but just so we'll hold my comments on, on that for now, but just to uh, reemphasize this continues to be a very important and rapidly evolving issue uh, and the staff remains focused on advancing our standard setting efforts in this area. Uh, for our alternative meat and dairy project, um, uh, Devin, our project manager, was able to provide the board with an update in our December board meeting, focusing on reviewing the evidence and market input we've gathered so far related to that project and um, discussing some of the potential implications for standard setting priorities. Um, the board provided some very valuable feedback in that session to help identify next steps for the staff, including some targeted additional research and consultation. Devin has been pursuing that work and based on that additional work, uh, working then to develop a recommendation for the board on whether to proceed to standard setting, and if so, what the scope of that project will include. Um, we're currently anticipating being able to bring that recommendation forward in our next standards board meeting. And the last project that I'll touch on here briefly um, is our project focused on uh, supply chains in the tobacco industry. Uh, staff has conducted a series of consultative activities with companies and investors uh, and additional evidence gathering and analysis. And again, similarly, is working to prepare a recommendation for next steps on this project. Again, targeting to, to bring that forward to the board uh, in our next meeting. So that's a, a quick overview of a lot of work going on uh, across these different research projects. Just pause here quickly, see if there's any questions on any of that work. Um, otherwise, we'll move on to some updates on our standard setting activities. Great. So lots of activity on the standard setting front as well. And um, similarly, uh, just going to walk us through our pipeline here, which you can see um, depicted on this slide. Um, in, you can see each of the projects listed, key dates or milestones across the top, and then the red dots indicate um, our current uh, approximation for when we would be seeking a board decision related to these projects. Similarly, thought it would be helpful to walk through and provide quick updates on each of these projects, particularly those that aren't on the agenda for today. Um, if we start at the top with our raw material sourcing and apparel project, um, this project is focused on how companies in the industry access certain priority raw materials 
and how environmental, environmental or social issues can affect that access uh, to those key priority materials. Uh, and it's really looking at a couple of metrics associated with the topic and seeking to identify, understand, and um, execute improvements to those measurement methodologies. So in the last board meeting, Taylor provided us with an update on her consultative findings and her, uh, some of her research and analysis based on um, those, uh, those engagements and proposed some next steps, um, really recommending to maintain the current scope of the project and pursue revisions consistent with that scope. And based on the board's feedback uh, and discussion in that meeting, Taylor is currently working toward preparing materials um, for a public comment period, including uh, some potential uh, revisions in an exposure draft and basis for conclusions to accompany um, for review by the board. And uh, she's working diligently towards um, having those materials prepared uh, and targeting a public comment period in the first half of the year, targeting uh, hopefully before our next board meeting to have those materials for the board for review. A very similar timeline uh, for our systemic risk project, uh, which of course is focusing on evaluating the systemic risk topic and associated metrics in our asset management industry standard. Um, in the, last board in the last board meeting, Anton provided the board with an update and presented some of his preliminary conclusions based on the extensive um, research and stakeholder consultations he's conducted around this issue. Um, so the board was able to review and provide input on the staff's recommendation. Anton then focused on um, carrying forward uh, what he heard from the board in the last meeting. Uh, and quite similarly to the raw material sourcing project, which I just mentioned, Anton's currently focused on preparing mat materials for a public comment period, including an exposure draft and basis for conclusions, and um, to, to submit that to the board for review, working again towards initiating a public comment period in the first half of the year. Based on our current plans, we anticipate bringing these materials to the board relatively soon, likely before the materials associated with the raw material sourcing project. So really trying to organize and sequence, sequence this out uh, and uh, of course anticipating uh, hopefully uh, a couple um, engagements with the public around these projects in the not too distant future, which is really exciting to see this work advance. I'll move next to our tailings management project. Um, so the, the board voted uh, in towards the end of last year in December to initiate a public comment period for this project. That public comment period is, is still open. Um, we published an invitation to comment associated with that public comment period uh, that includes an exposure draft, um, basis for conclusions and questions for respondents. All those materials can be found on the project page on our website uh, and comments can be submitted uh, through our website you can find out how to do that right on that project page. Uh, so just to remind the board and the public that public comment period uh, is scheduled to conclude in, in just under a month on March 17th um, of this year. And after that uh, closes, we'll of course be reviewing all the comments that we uh, received um, and of course um, uh, presenting those for consideration by the board to deliberate on next steps, including whether to proceed uh, toward uh, preparing an updated standard for review by the board. Um, all this, of course, will depend on what we hear in, in the public comment period, and uh, we do very much encourage uh, any, uh, any interested parties in this project to review those materials and welcome uh, input and comments on um, those materials that I just mentioned. Jeff, I see you jumped on. Uh, uh, anything you'd like to add here? Yeah, actually, it was uh, it was a question. I know that the um, the website, SASB's website, has gone through a, a big refresh re recently, and um, uh, just a question on how quickly public comments get posted, um, and just so that the, the public might also be aware of when they submit a public comment letter, it will be public. Uh, wondering like, how quickly that that is uh, going to happen. Yeah, that's a very good question, Jeff. So as you mentioned in our rules of procedure, we uh, all public comments, the letters that we receive, we will post on our website. We're still in the process of collecting public comments for this particular project. And I think once we receive those, we're, we're talking to folks on our team in terms of the process that we'll go through to get those posted on the website. But you can expect us to do so relatively quickly after the close of that public comment period so that the public's able to see uh, what we received, what we heard, what we considered, um, as we move towards potentially issuing a standards update. So I don't have the exact timing for you just yet, um, but I'm happy to share that with the board and with the public uh, once we've established uh, exactly when we expect to get those up on the website. Yeah. Thanks, David. Thank you, Jeff. 
so that's a big uh, milestone for us this year, focusing on that project um, and look forward and again, encourage um, stakeholders to provide uh, your input as part of that project. Um, uh, it would be fantastic to get uh, the viewpoints of uh, companies, investors and subject matter experts uh, as part of that public comment period. Uh, moving to the next project here, our Plastics, Plastics, Risks, and Opportunities project. I always struggle with that one. Um, the staff is currently uh, actively pursuing consultative activities um, around uh, that project, working towards developing an exposure draft uh, and a potential revised uh, topic and metrics uh, for the chemicals and pulp and paper standard. As a reminder, that project's looking at uh, the impacts of um, plastics across these industries and how companies are adjusting their business models based on evolving regulation and issues pertaining to single-use plastics um, and other issues around this um, around plastics use. Um, the results of the consultation ultimately are going to drive the exact timing for the preparation of, of those materials, but we're um, anticipating that we'll be in a position to present um, uh, exposure draft and basis for conclusions, public comment related materials to the board uh, for review by mid-year. And then uh, I mentioned the content moderation project on the previous uh, slide. Our standard setting efforts uh, related to this issue um, are captured in our content governance in the internet media and services project. Um, for this project, uh, staff is currently pursuing consultative activities with companies, investors, and subject matter experts. Uh, these are really exploring how SASB can address this issue in the internet media and services industry, including how we might craft topics and metrics uh, to capture uh, and help companies disclose in a comparable decision useful way on, on this issue. Um, so we, we expect those consultative activities to continue um, into the second quarter of the year. And of course, we want to take that into account when we're establishing our forward timing, but based on the results of those consultative activities we anticipate we may be in a position to provide an update to the board in the next board meeting and then perhaps target um, uh, an exposure draft um, for the following meeting but of course much to come based on the results of those consultative activities hey Kurt hey David um, you know you've mentioned a number of projects here and and the status of them and yeah. made a brief mention anyway of the our website redesign and yeah. You guys spent a lot of time on that to make it more user friendly and information rich. Could you spend a couple minutes talking about how that redesign will help our various constituents? Thanks, Kurt. Yeah, great question. So uh, one of our major organizational initiatives um, last year was uh, efforts to make our website a lot more effective for folks who are visiting, trying to find information, and particularly for our standard setting efforts helping the public understand what we're working on and what we're seeking to engage the market to learn more about, and then particularly making it as frictionless as possible for folks to then engage and provide your input. So there's a number of different changes that have taken place related to our website to try to make that, to try to achieve those objectives. Uh, one of the key things is we've really overhauled our active projects page, which you can find under the standards section of our website and tried to make that much easier for a stakeholder to understand what SASB is working on, um, what phase particular projects are in, when we're seeking market feedback, what that feedback, um, uh, what specific questions we have for the public, and then providing a very simple, easy to follow way uh, for you to engage with us to provide that input through very clear links to how you can get engaged. Um, so those changes have been, uh, I, for me, very welcome and uh, glad to see that we've hopefully made this a bit easier for folks to get engaged and, and understand and, and provide input on these projects. Of course, we welcome ongoing feedback on ways we can continue to improve. A couple other quick things I'll mention that may be of value to folks who perhaps you've heard a project here that you're particularly interested in. Um, one function that we've added is for any particular project, you can subscribe to project alerts, um, just one click um, uh, on the project page to do so. And you'll then be subscribed and whenever there's a, a major development or update related to one of these projects, you'll get a notification in an email uh, about that update so that you can really stay engaged on the projects that are most important to you. And so we have uh, several hundred folks who have signed up for those. And uh, so far, I think they've been a, a helpful tool for folks who, 
who really want uh, to, to stay up to date on how some of this work is advancing and particularly understand um, when there's opportunities to engage in and provide feedback. Of course, we'll take feedback at any time, but there's certain periods like public comment periods that the public typically appreciates um, understanding when those have been initiated. So part of our efforts to make sure that that's as transparent and easily accessible for the market as possible. So if I'm in a specific industry as a corporate, I could just have flagged anything that shows up in uh, food and beverage or whatever. Something, yeah, something we've added is um, to the project pages, you can quickly see which projects affect which industries and subscribe to updates to those projects. So if you're in a particular industry, can quickly get to which are the projects that really could impact me that I want to pay attention to. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Kurt. The last couple projects here um, to, to touch on are, of course, our projects related to our governance documents, rules of procedure, and conceptual framework. Um, I won't spend a tremendous amount of time providing an update here, given this is on the agenda, and we'll be spending quite a bit of time discussing these. Um, but just to remind the public that um, we did have a public comment period for uh, proposed updates to those documents. That public comment period concluded at the end of last year. Um, and of course, um, the results, discussing the results of what we heard from the market is on the agenda for today, which will be a very uh, informative discussion. So moving from our project work, I just wanted to um, provide the board with just a, a few updates on um, some of the important things that are happening in this space um, and uh, sort of happening around the, the space of sustainability reporting and sustainability disclosure in general. So as the board may recall, in November of last year, um, some very exciting news, uh, SASB and IIRC announced our intent to merge and to come together under the Value Reporting Foundation, um, targeting completion of the merger um, mid this year. And um, just say that we're really excited about this development and everything um, that it, uh, all the opportunity that it creates. Um, really, this was directly in response to demands from the global market for convergence among reporting standard setters and and really importantly the integrated reporting framework and the SASB standards are complementary tools for investor focused communications with integrated reporting really providing a, a foundational leading framework for integrating sustainability information with financial and other ca other capitals and then SASB providing that industry specific disclosure standards to help uh, effectively disclose that sustainability information and so this was a really um, important step forward that's consistent with the vision um, that was laid out in a joint statement of intent um, titled our, the Comprehensive System for Corporate Reporting um, that was really described in a joint paper between um, CDP, CDSB, GRI, IRC, and SASB, lots of acronyms there, but um, this, this group of five framework and standard setters um, published uh, in September really um, describing this building building blocks approach um, to creating that comprehensive system for corporate reporting and how the different frameworks and standard setters provide those building blocks to help create that comprehensive system. And, and this merger represents a, a significant step forward consistent um, with the vision that was laid out in that paper. So there's a lot more to come on this throughout the year, um, but I wanted to provide a, just a quick reminder and update uh, to the board and public um, around this significant development in the field. Um, again, we're all very excited um, for this work to continue. Jeff, yeah. Yeah, I oh, just, uh, quick, yeah. Go ahead, uh, go ahead. Yeah, just, just quickly on the, the Value Reporting Foundation and uh, you know, the uh, uh, intention to merge there. Uh, you know, I think, as you mentioned, this is a, it's a really big step forward. Uh, you know, I think that the, uh, 99% of what I've seen in terms of the public's response to this is seems to be you know, very positive, very encouraging, and um, you know, and, and to be sure, I think there's that you know th this will bring uh, several work streams uh, along with it that will uh, uh, really take time and effort to 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 get the value that we see um, uh, to actually realize that value, but. But but I think it's uh, it's it really is a great opportunity to help to consolidate the field and and even you know I think in, in my view just talking about how we are all, you know we're trying to service the same um, market and essentially like we are trying to provide decision useful information to the capital markets and that is our goal when we say that as part of separate organizations we may use the same words and people may question the extent to which we actually mean the same things but it's easier to 
to help um, to bring clarity to that when we're all part of one organization. And so, uh, so I think it's it's great. And uh, and I do of course want to emphasize that the you know that the that the work that we do that we're we've been dedicated to for the last almost ten years now at SASB is going to continue to be our, our focus of uh, you know broad sustainability issues focused on uh, in you know uh, the in industry specific uh, information that, that we hear that the market needs. So, uh, but anyways, it's great to, to see. And, uh, and you know, I know you're heavily involved in, in probably, you know, all of those work streams or most of those work streams that are gonna be coming along. So I appreciate your effort in this as well. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, genuinely excited about all the opportunities that I'm, I'm seeing that will come from this and, and totally agree. We still have plenty of work cut out for us here with the standards board and the staff around our, our standard setting efforts. So it's certainly no changes there uh, in our focus, um, but a lot of benefit to come. Um, next big topic to talk about uh, is uh, of course the ongoing um, efforts at the IFRS Foundation around um, their focus on what they might do in the area of sustainability reporting. Um, so we did share a little bit on this in the last meeting, but just to kind of get us back up to speed on what we discussed uh, in December and then some new developments related to this. Um, as a reminder, um, the uh, IFRS initiated a consultation last year uh, to explore um, the potential role uh, that they could take in the area of sustainability reporting. That consultation concluded at the end of last year, and that was really focused on um, the IF IFRS trustees seeking to understand what the foundation could do around sustainability reporting. Um, that grew out of a task force of the trustees that was established in January of last year, and, and that task force had worked really closely with investors, regulators, uh, central banks, uh, audits, auditors, and, um, and others to really explore and understand uh, sustainability reporting and the potential role that the IFRS could play. And so as they shared in, in the consultative materials that I'm sure many folks uh, who are tuned in here um, were, were read through in great detail, um, they found, of course, as, as part of those task force efforts, um, really growing interest in sustainability reporting, but a, a key aspect of that uh, consultative document noted um, the urgent need to improve the consistency and comp comparability of sustainability reporting, which certainly is a language that, that SASB speaks. Um, the consultation featured 11 questions posed by the trustees, and those were really designed to help evaluate the IFRS's role and remit um, if they were to uh, to move into this space. And that was part of uh, the IFRS's five-year review of its strategy, which started in January of 2019. So really important development in the field. And uh, that consultation ended at the end of last year. And the IFRS recently shared um, sort of the, the first look at uh, some of the results that were uh, received during that, um, that consultation period. And particularly, um, in response to a review of answers to the first three questions from that consultation paper. Uh, so coming out of a meeting that took place in early February, uh, they shared some uh, initial signals of, of what we can expect to come. Um, they shared that they received uh, 576 comment letters, um, quite, quite a bit of interest, um, which is to be expected and that those responses indicated a growing and urgent demand to improve the global consistency and comparability in sustainability reporting, really reinforcing that what the IFRS had found in that task force exercise. Um, and, th and they also observed a demand uh, for the IFRS Foundation to play a role. Um, and that was consistent, again, with um, what the task force had discovered in their uh, preliminary investigation into the issue that I shared on the previous slide. Uh, coming out of that February meeting, the trustees agreed to form a steering committee that will oversee the next phases of the work. Um, and they, importantly, they defined a key requirement for success being uh, the urgent need for global standards and most notably um, within the pantheon of ESG, um, perhaps a focus on climate being, um, being uh, particularly important. So the next meeting of the trustees will take place in early March. And IFRS noted their intent to produce a definitive proposal by the end of September of this year, um, possibly leading to an announcement at COP26 uh, in November, again, later this year. Um, this, of course, remains highly important uh, development in the field. Um, Brian shared highlights from our response to the consultation last month. Again, if, if folks are interested in, in, in reviewing that, it is available on our website. 
uh, if you'd like to see our full response. Of course, SASB is supportive in principle of what the IFRS is pursuing in this area, given the importance of this information for capital markets. But ne needless to say, incredibly important development in the field, one which we will be monitoring closely uh, and, um, and continuing to remain engaged with. Related to this, um, late last year, um, I, I wanted to share a publication that uh, was launched late last year that, that we participated in. Um, this was a publication, again, issued by that, that group of five that I mentioned uh, a couple slides ago. Um, that's CDSB, the Climate Disclosure Standards Board, the Global Reporting Initiative, Integrated Reporting, and SASB. I, I didn't use the acronyms this time. <laughs> Shortly after our board meeting in December, we issued this paper, which is um, titled Reporting on Enterprise Value, um, illustrated with a prototype climate-related financial disclosure standard. Um, this was really a follow-up to that September joint statement of intent that I mentioned. Um, and what this consisted of was, pub was a, a prototype climate standard that was really designed to tangibly demonstrate some of those concepts from that joint statement of intent, and particularly how the standards and frameworks of the group of five can be brought together to provide a comprehensive and robust solution for climate-related financial disclosure. So this really um, brings those elements together powerfully to uh, create a comprehensive solution around uh, climate-related financial disclosure. So there's three broad focuses in, in that paper. I, I won't spend a ton of time, there's a lot in it, and I would highly recommend folks who are interested to, to read through it, because I think it's, it's, it's a very interesting presentation of some of those concepts from that Group of Five paper, and particularly focused around climate. But just some, some broad things that that, um, that paper focused on. Number one, um, to sort of set the stage, it recaps uh, some of the key concepts from that joint statement of intent that was issued in September and particularly focusing on those elements that are subsequently illustrated in, in the prototype. Then it provides observations around the applicability of the IASB's conceptual framework for financial reporting to sustainability-related financial disclosures. And that's a really important foundational discussion around um, the conceptual framework that would govern and define um, sustainability-related financial disclosures, which is then applied in the context of climate-related disclosure. And then third, it demonstrates how the Group of Five framework and standards, along with the TCFD recommendations, could form the basis for the development of a climate-related financial disclosure standard. So that's really the details of how these different elements come together to really support effective disclosure focused on capital markets. So really the intent here is we hope this is a, a prototype that is a helpful example of the concepts from that joint statement of intent that could serve as a running start for future standards development, for example, that could be taken up um, by the IFRS. So uh, for those that are interested, highly recommend uh, reading this paper. Uh, it's conceptually uh, dense, but in ways that I think are quite informative and important. Um, Jeff, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, David. Uh, great, great overview of, of this paper, and um, you know, a couple of things, just to, like more more comments than than anything else. But one, you know, one comment again. This is uh, not a due process document from the various bodies, but it, in fact, you know, sort of a uh, let's you know, prototype is the right word to be using because sort of like a thought exercise of how we mm -hmm. might uh, see the complementary nature of the various organizations uh, working together to 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 be a basis for some type of a of a uh, a a robust approach to climate-related uh, financial disclosure. So, um, but one thing I really like about this this effort is, uh, and and really maybe like the building blocks approach that we we mm -hmm. talk a lot about. Um, you know, I think two things about the building blocks that I think is really important for people to take away. One is that you know, the building blocks, like the blocks, are not in competition with each other, right? They're they're serving different purposes, uh, and it's because each of these organizations started with a particular mission that they, they, they were trying to fulfill and it, it, it arose out of a market need. And so uh, that's why there are different blocks and, and they build to something bigger than the individual pieces, which I think is, is really important. And so um, yeah. you know, I, I think it emphasizes the complementary nature of, of, of why, how we do what we do and, mm -hmm. and the importance of a robust solution to, to reporting needs, having a building blocks approach, because if we leave out a significant block, then there, there, there is the potential for a, a gap in the marketplace, um, you know, in terms of what is being uh, asked for. And so, um, so anyway, it's great. I appreciate the fact that that, that SASB has taken this approach of supporting a, a of the building blocks 
Um, and and I, I would note that IOSCO has taken a, a similar view, it seems, uh, from from some of their recent um, um, press releases. So so you know, very exciting to see. But uh, I see Mark uh, has jumped on as well. So uh, Mark, I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, Jeff. Uh, also, uh, probably more a comment than a uh, than, than a question, but uh, saying that, you know, having read this uh, the, the document, I think it is a, a, a very good contribution to the discussion that which will be helpful to clarify, you know, to uh, many of the the people at the moment, considering how this all comes together, you know, how the the, the various standard setters could work together, and uh, there are a number of uh, elaborations, I think, on, for example, the concept of dynamic materiality that we will come to talk to uh, probably later today. Uh, that I think are really worth looking at, and and uh, and and see what we can pick up from uh, from that discussion. Uh, you know, also when we're talking about conceptual framework, that was uh, one comment. And yeah, Chef, I was also going to mention. I, I did note the uh, the IOSCO. Uh, uh, announcement that came out yesterday that uh, that uh, specifically also referenced the need for industry-specific uh, metrics uh, on sustainability as part of the, uh, the, the the full setup, which I think is important uh, uh, from our perspective that that is being recognised. And I, I just going to say that IOSCO was a crucial factor also at the time when IFRS came about, and so yes. they do reference to the fact that they uh, they were a driving force behind that. And I think the announcement of yesterday, therefore, for me at least, was uh, was quite significant. Thanks. Hey, Mark, yeah, this, Mark, this is Kurt. I had not had a chance to read the IOSCO yet, but I guess one of the elements with the IRFRS is whether they will adopt industry specific, right? Which would be a big, big difference for uh, for SASB anyway. Yes, and uh, if if you look at the moment, clearly, you know, in the in the financial reporting uh, um, structure, there is not an industry specific. Uh, it's all based on on the, the concept of contracts rather than on specific industries. Although some are more, you know, contracts are so industry specific that they are only applicable, for example, to the insurance industry. But I think it's a big a big discussion still to be had to, how how you fit, you know, the principle based system of the financial reporting together with the um, the more industry specific uh, standards that we have. And I think that's a discussion to be had but it's, it's positive that i also recognize that the two go together yeah yeah on that point uh mark about uh you know this the prototype and, and some of the work that is in there in sort of advancing this idea of how it all fits together uh, i completely agree with your your point that this is going to come back to uh some of our discussion probably today on the conceptual framework but certainly on that project because when we started our conceptual framework rewrite you know uh revision um, we weren't being pushed to really connect, really connect to financial reporting. And, uh, and after we put out the revision, you know, we saw the interest from the IFRS Foundation and others. And, uh, uh, and so this group of five work, I think, has been a, a great way for us to start to engage more uh, around how we can be more helpful in, in connecting some of the, the pieces for, uh, for the marketplace. And, uh, and so I'm sure this can, can be beneficial to the work that we're doing. Right. Thanks. Yeah, fantastic. I'll just say, um, you know, based on the the comments, I just want to recognize uh, our our partners in this. This was a really interesting exercise to think through exactly the issues that that were raised um, by by Jeff, Mark, and Kurt here, and really thinking about how these things can come together and what uh, conceptual framework or concepts would would be applied in the process of doing so. And so. Um, just huge thanks to our partner organizations in, in working with us to develop this, um, CDP, CDSB, GRI, and IRC, as well as the impact management project um, and the coordinating role that they played. So um, major thanks uh, and uh, yes, uh, a very interesting uh, document and encourage those who are interested in um, some of the discussion that we just had to, to dive in and, and learn more on that uh, prototype and discussion paper. So a couple more slides for me here, and then I'll wrap up and, and uh, we can jump into exciting updates on our human capital project from Kelly. But I just want to mention a uh, continued um, amazing support from the investment community um, for SASB, most recently demonstrated in uh, Larry Fink's annual letter to CEOs, um, of course, the CEO of BlackRock. Uh, the letter uh, emphasized uh, really the global threat posed by climate change and emphasized the fact that climate risk is investment risk. Um, a number of very important uh, points made in that, in that letter. Um, particularly important to SASB is the emphasis on investor needs for consistent, high quality information on ESG factors that impact the value of companies. 
And in the letter, Mr. Fink reiterates BlackRock's endorsement of TCFD and SASB aligned reporting um, to help get that information into, into public markets. Um, so just incredibly uh, you know, humbling to, to see that support and, and certainly uh, helps us uh, uh, recognize the, the value of what we do and, and how we can help uh, capital markets through our work. Um, this is uh, the latest in a series of, of high profile um, investor or investor associations who have expressed support for SASB over the past year. The board may of course recall last year's letter from uh, from Cyrus Taraporavala, similarly called on companies to use the SASB standards. Um, last year, a group of the largest pension fund managers in Canada asked portfolio companies to use the SASB standards and the TCFD recommendations. Our investor advisory group issued an updated statement um, calling on companies to use the SASB standards and disclosures to investors. And um, the Board of Governors of the Investment Company Institute also um, issued a statement encouraging U.S. Uh, public companies to provide disclosure aligned with SASB and TCFD. So just all really important signals, uh, signs of continued momentum that is connected to one of our core tenets and our conceptual framework, ensuring that our standards provide decision useful information to, to capital markets. Let me pause there. Mark, I saw you jumped on. Did you Did you want to add a comment? Sure. Thanks, David. I mean, I think this is this. I think you you hit the nail on the head. This is exactly right. The um, the support that we've gotten from investors has been phenomenal. The the ICI Institute, which is the bottom of that um, of the slide, mm -hmm. is a very very uh, big organization. Um, usually um, usually very circumspect circumspect before they weigh in on a topic like this. And so for them to acknowledge that there's a you know, there's emerging consensus around SASB and TCFD, what I thought was uh, was was really interesting. We continue to to hear from companies, or I continue to hear from companies in my day job about, um, you know, uh, trying to understand the difference between stewardship investors and active investors, and and, yeah. and so, you know, I I think if um if you could talk a little bit about that that breakdown and and how we continue to see. Um, you know, certainly the stewardship investors very, very strongly um, influencing, but also we're continuing to see the active investors participate significantly in our IAG, et cetera. Yeah, it's a great point, Mark. And I, I think that's um, one thing that is incredibly helpful about our investor advisory group and our standards advisory group is uh, there's really a lot of intentionality in um, constructing the composition of that group to recognize the diversity that exists within the investment um, within the investment world you know we often refer to investors as though that that represents some sort of monolith but of course as you just described mark there are many different uses use cases for this information for uh, sustainability information depending on a particular investor's um, strategy their position within the investment landscape and and so on and we're very mindful of that and that's um, very intentionally built into our process when we talk about um, the utility of information, the decision usefulness, and some of the characteristics of metrics and topics. Again, I'm, we keep going back to the conceptual framework, but, but really it, it puts the onus on the staff in, in those engagement and consultative activities to understand what the different use cases are of different market participants, depending on where they sit in the investment landscape and test that thinking around how is this information useful in driving investment decision-making, depending on all of these different use cases. So I won't say that's an easy or straightforward thing to uh, to do, but it is inherently baked into our process to, to have those considerations inform what we on the staff, of course, recommend to the board. and. As you just uh, touched on, Mark, it's something that the board is focused on as well in applying the conceptual framework to um, the recommendations that we bring forward. So I think uh, just to tie it back to this slide, it's gr it's it's really fantastic to see the diverse range of investors um, at you know asset owners, asset managers, active, passive, stewardship, etc., who are engaged and find value in the work that we do. Um, but but in in providing that value going forward, we need to ensure that those voices are. Um, loudly heard in our process and we are we're fortunate to have the conceptual framework that enables us to ensure that that consistently will be the case um, so very important and uh, maybe nuanced issue for some but but highly important to our ability to serve um, our our constituents um, in terms of capital market participants any other questions or comments here otherwise i can wrap up with one last slide um, which is an important one um, <laughs> so i want to take a 
a quick opportunity to, to share with the board uh, some exciting news and, and with the public that our team is growing. Um, and uh, we're really excited about this. Um, we're in the process of hiring for three positions right now, um, three very important positions within the team. Uh, we are hiring for analysts uh, to lead our financial sector as well as our technology and communication sectors to very, very important, all of our sectors are important, but <laughs> these are, are definitely important as well. Uh, and uh, we're also, uh, uh, we'll be posting very soon a position for a climate lead to lead our research efforts around climate change and the implications um, for our standards, given, uh, as we just heard uh, from Mr. Fink's letter, the uh, financial materiality broadly of climate risk. Um, so these are gonna be really impactful positions for our team. <clears throat> As you've probably picked up on from my prior comments, we are pursuing a lot of exciting and impactful work uh, uh, across the team and across the organization. And so um, really would encourage folks who are interested to learn more about these positions to visit the careers section on our website and join a, a very active, enthusiastic team um, pursuing uh, work uh, related to ensuring capital markets have the information they need on these incredibly important issues. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that for folks. Um, we're really excited about this uh, and can't wait to welcome a few new members to our uh, to our amazing team. So I'll, I'll go ahead and wrap up my comments there. I want to make sure we have plenty of time for Kelly uh, to dive in and give us an update on our human capital research project. But just want to thank the board for giving me the um, the opportunity to provide a few of these updates on our projects and some of the key developments. And we'll just pause here and see if we have any uh, additional questions before handing it over to Kelly. Thanks, David. Uh, that was great. Um, maybe just one thing quickly on on the, on yeah. the, the climate uh, expert that we're looking to hire. Um, yes. Maybe you could give a little bit of context because I think a climate expert that would um, you know that would fit SASB's need wouldn't necessarily be you know the climate expert that would fit every organization's need. And we have a particular <laughs> approach to the way that we do things. So, I, you know, if people are out there listening, thinking like, is this the role for me? I mean, you know, any any thoughts on on it in particular yeah. what would what would help with that? Yeah, it's a great question, Jeff. Thank you. So we're really looking um, ideally for someone with a, a technical background, a real understanding of core uh, climate science and the application of that science to um, economic or financially material impacts to capital markets. And so um, the, once the position's posted, definitely encourage you to look at the details of that position, but really see the importance of that deep technical understanding of the issue and then the ability to translate the significant volume of active research regulatory developments and so on through to specific standard setting priorities where that fil that process of filtering is through the application of our conceptual framework and understanding the implications of all the emerging and continuing growing body of evidence, the implications of that for financially material impacts to companies based on industry, and therefore where our standard setting priorities should be focused. And so this person really is gonna own that um, process of identification, monitoring, analysis, and then strategic development of where our priorities need to be based on the synthesis and understanding of all of that information. So it's a really exciting position. and. Um, I uh, look forward to um, uh, posting that job description and uh, I hope we get a lot of uh, excited candidates uh, to, to lead that function within SASB, which uh, is a very, very important position for us. Great, thanks David, that's very helpful. Um, any other thoughts before we turn the time over to Kelly? I see no attempts to, to jump in, so, uh, so why don't we go ahead and pass it over to to Kelly. Um, welcome, Kelly. It's always great to see you. Nice to see you, Jeff, and thank you so much for the opportunity to give you an update on our human capital research project. So uh, just to jump in here, uh, for today's agenda, we're going to be covering some two areas, uh, an update on the most recent uh, phase of the project, the public consultation, and then I'd like to just discuss some next steps for board engagement. So specifically, we'll revisit the objectives of the public consultation, discuss some high level themes that we're observing from the quantitative results of this survey data, and then we'll uh, discuss some major milestones uh, which require the board's engagement. 
So just as a quick reminder about uh, this project, uh, we've seen this slide several times before, but I do want to just remind the board uh, that the objective of this research project is really to develop this evidence-based and market-informed uh, framework on human capital, which will help us to define human capital across our standards and ultimately um, set our agenda for future standard setting. Uh, additionally, as a reminder to the board, uh, these are just the five themes that encapsulate nine sub-themes that were in our preliminary framework and that we asked um, uh, participants in the public consultation to comment on. So again, just recalling uh, the public consultation objective, our intention here was really to solicit the public's view uh, on the industry agnostic themes that we outlined in the revised preliminary framework and to develop this evidence-based and market-informed view on how these themes manifest at an industry-specific level. And this was a really critical stage of our research project uh, since the feedback we received from stakeholders um, will guide the human capital project pipeline uh, and will help us to more comprehensively address uh, the issue of human capital within our standards. So more specifically, we, asked, we issued three stakeholder specific surveys uh, for companies, investors, and subject matter experts. So we designed these surveys to really extract information specific, specific to each stakeholder uh, to understand how the industry agnostic themes are outlined in the framework manifest at this industry specific level, um, in addition to asking about the financial materiality of these issues. So specifically um, for companies, we wanted to understand their corporate views and strategies around the financial materiality of these themes and sub-themes uh, in the framework and also how they manage and track these particular issues uh, as a company. Uh, for investors, we really wanted to understand their views um, kind of at this higher level, portfolio level um, on the financial materiality of these themes and sub-themes um, across our 77 industry standards um, and understand and identify which industry trends kind of support their materiality view. And lastly, for subject matter experts, we ask questions around their views uh, around the themes and sub-themes, and uh, particularly regarding if um, these themes or sub-themes should be added or removed to um, SASB's consideration, and if they should be measured in a more decision-useful uh, and or cost-effective way. So just as some examples, um, I've, I've outlined some of the questioning that we provided in each survey. So as you can see with companies, uh, we asked to them to discuss the context of their corporate strategy. Uh, where, where investors, we asked uh, them to answer the materiality across a portfolio of, of companies. So kind of taking this more um, industry specific view. And for both groups, we asked them to contextualize their answers um, it, you know, in terms of linking the sub-themes to channels of financial impact. So we mean assets, liabilities, revenues, expenses, cost of capital, et cetera. Um, and for companies, we really wanted to um, have them rate the materiality uh, of these issues from highly material to completely immaterial, uh, whereas investors, we asked them to rate them at you know, the materiality across multiple industries. So does this apply to all or nearly all industries or largely not material to all industries? For subject matter experts, um, on the other hand, we were we asked more about the content related to the evidence in the framework and their views on how to measure and incorporate these themes. Um, multiple choice ask, um, questions were asked to, uh, to the subject matter experts as well to respond uh, to these sub-themes sub um, and if they should be added or removed and um, if they could be designed to be more decision useful or cost effective. But all the participants were asked uh, to provide a longer free form response in our additional comments and feedback section um, where we offered engagement questions to kind of guide their feedback and ask respondents to elaborate on their multiple choice questions um, in the survey or address issues that were not um, adequately addressed in our framework. So getting into some of the results, um, while we're still receiving stakeholder input from the consultation, these are some numbers that were pulled um, most recently. So we received um, 
roughly 25 uh, corporate res uh, respondent uh, responses, 22 investor responses, which were largely um, asset managers from all different types of roles, um, various sizes from um, very large asset managers to um, smaller asset managers focused on um, social impact investing or other types of um, ESG type um, investing. And then lastly, uh, we received 57 subject matter expert responses, and um, that included a wide swath of uh, respondents, including academics, uh, consultants, uh, civil society organizations, um, other standard setters, and uh, raters and rankers. Oh, and I do want to note, just uh, going back to the previous slide, um, that these were pretty much in line with our um, with our expectations. The subject matter expert uh, uh, category was uh, expected to be the largest, just given that it was a catch-all for kind of anyone that wasn't a company or an investor. Um, I do want to remind the board that this is still kind of early days uh, on the count since extensions were granted to some uh, respondents. Um, and this also doesn't include um, some of the supplemental consultations that analysts are doing um, to focus more on the industry specific impacts and um, understanding the materiality of at this industry specific level. Um, additionally, I just wanted to note uh, that the, with the new uh, Regulation SK rule coming in around human capital disclosure, we are monitoring um, those reports as well, and it is a really good basis for um, data for us uh, as companies are beginning to report and disclose on human capital. So based on the aggregated and quantitative data from the survey, um, we believe that the research project objective- hey, Kelly, can I ask you a question before you go on? I mean, you've kind of anticipated what I wanted to ask, but I'm just wondering if, if you're satisfied with the industry breadth of the responses you're getting. I know you have other inputs than just the surveys, but it kind of struck me, 25 companies obviously doesn't cover all of 77 industries and you are looking to draw conclusions here that will i think there's like supposed to be a heat map of of issues in different industries so you'll need fairly broad input i, I was going to comment too that there might be some use in the sec filings on this issue but you've you've covered that yeah thanks dan i'm happy to answer that i, I think for the company results they were a little bit slim uh, but I, I know that our analysts are also reaching out to companies that did not respond to the survey following up uh, scheduling consultations. So the numbers that we presented in this slide are probably a little more robust, even um, un underestimated, uh, just because it doesn't count all the work that our analysts are doing on that front uh, with their individual consultations. Uh, for the investors, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, we could we could always use more input uh, that's always appreciated. Uh, I, I was very impressed just with the different size and breadth of um, the investor input, just kind of in terms of uh, size of the asset manager based off of AUM, what they focus on. So it was a really great mix. And um, you know, I think what we're largely seeing from the responses is that there's a very similar line of thinking, um, just generally speaking among investors. So. Um, I felt like this was probably a very good sample size of, um, you know, what we're hearing uh, and understanding from investors. Right. But how, how random is it? I mean, is there an industry focus to the people that chose to respond, or pretty much across the board? Yeah, I, I felt like it was very much across the board. Um, you know, and a lot of these uh, asset managers are covering several industries, so have a lot of great insights on, um, you know, all the different industries. But uh, what I think is most noteworthy is that a lot of um, companies or and investors pulled in different um, analysts or departments to kind of answer the questions. So we're getting uh, responses like from a very broad company view, which is really great as opposed to one specific uh, analyst or department um, so we can understand what that looks like at a very high level. Okay, thanks. Great. 
All right. Um, so I just wanted to say, just based on uh, the aggregated and quantitative data from the surveys, uh, we believe that the research objectives of this project have largely been met just based off of the general consensus among um, most companies, investors, and subject matter experts around the relevance of these themes, and in some cases around the financial materiality of the themes and sub-themes in the framework. Uh, just some other early insights uh, that we wanted to note, um, there's four of them. The first one just being that um, there's evidence and stakeholder views that suggest that some of these issues that we outlined in the framework um, are more widespread across our 77 industries um, and are currently not um, applied consistently across our 77 industry standards. Uh, the second observation that we've made from the results is that there's really, like I've said, consensus around stakeholders around the relevance of these themes. Um, but again, the case for financial materiality of these themes and sub-themes truly varies by the industry, um, just depending on the industry's general um, industry characteristics. Uh, the third observation that we've made is that um, there's really a dis also a disparity in stakeholder views between investors and companies, uh, particularly around the materiality of some of these issues. Uh, so it's been really interesting to see that in some of the results and trying to square those up. And then the last point I'd make is that um, really around COVID, just given its uh, broad global impact um, and also the ensuing protests for racial justice, it's really raised the relevance of certain themes uh, and to some extent accelerated some of the uh, macro environmental value drivers that we mentioned in our framework. And so as a result, it could have longer term implications for both companies and investors. So for companies that could relate to how they manage their workforces and for investors, this could be uh, mean a change in what issues become uh, more relevant and potentially financially material. And I, could, I saw you jumped on. Hey, Kelly. Yeah, you raised this page raises a couple of interesting topics, I guess. The first looking at number four there that clearly with COVID-19, remote work and all that, companies are rethinking some of their human capital management. And so we should be hitting at a good time. Um, one thing you might think about is, uh, and I know we tend to ask for feedback in an in independent focus area, but, uh, you know, you might consider doing some group calls, kind of focus sessions with either multiple corporates at the same time to get that kind of dialogue going or multiple investors that have different views. Because um, I think we all learn from each other on these things. So it might be a way to stir the pot a little bit. Um, my question is this disparity in views between investors and companies. Any any structural issues that investors think that more is important or less or anything initial coming back from that? Yeah, um, I mean, I think what comes to mind, and I know this is just a, a very hot topic, is the diversity and inclusion topic. Um, I find it really interesting that um, investors, just very generally speaking, high level, say like, highly material across all or nearly all industries, very important. Um, companies that they kind of vary, I, you know, I would have expected them to kind of mimic that response with, by saying highly material, um, but they kind of rate it as more moderately material. Um, and it's really interesting to understand, you know, through how they contextualize their responses, like what that, how that kind of squares up. So, um, I, you know, we definitely do need to do some more digging, more analysis, but just high level, I found that very interesting and um, given the importance of it, <laughs> um, it'll be important to look into. Yeah, yeah and this is, uh, if I may uh, also raise a point here. So I noted that uh, from the corporates, it's mainly sustainability professionals who uh, have responded, whereas, um, you know, there would be different functions that would own the human capital issue. Um, so I guess that's another uh, challenge to look into is, is who owns the issue or the problem if there is perceived to be one. And then just reflection on the materiality because what strikes me in, in this particular research is that here we are certainly also looking at the impact to 
uh, the people so that the human capital uh, is looking at the value creation or potential erosion on the part of the company, the employer, but uh, how do we then factor in the, uh, the dimension about impact uh, to the people? Thank you. Great, thanks Suzanne. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I think it's, this topic is just so broad and I think there's a lot of um, different ways people are thinking about human capital. I, I think from a SASB perspective, I think we're trying to understand, you know, how companies are like, put very simply, I guess, just kind of managing and treating their people to create long-term value creation. So it kind of ties to, you know, how productive they are, how they're feeling, um, you know, the environment of the workplace. So, um, you know, I think that's kind of been our focus on this in this particular project, but I think we recognize that there's a lot of other impacts, other um, things that are happening related to human capital and, um, you know, have much broader implications. So we'll have to look at that a little bit more, but I think we're trying to, um, be very narrow at first as we think about these uh, about these issues. I think I'm next here, and Kelly, I'm I'm really curious to see this early insights on point two here, level of materiality varying by industry, um, and especially focusing. I, I believe you said the the survey questions to corporates and investors were asking for feedback on the materiality of the the five key themes and the 11 sub themes. And I'm wondering across both corporates and investors, did was there anything that stood out as having strong feedback that it's not material to both groups or either group that we should really be focusing on either getting additional feedback on or doing specific research in, in one of those themes? Uh, yeah, thanks Verity for the question. I, I think um, I'll just preface that we have much more work to do on the analysis side. I, so my comments are very high level, but based off of what I've seen, you know, I think um, the diversity inclusion question was very interesting to me, um, just given the different levels of materiality versus investors and companies. Um, the other one that I found interesting was maybe alternative workforce. Uh, that, you know, I think maybe a while back uh, it had been very material. Uh, with these new results, it seems a little more um, lukewarm this time around. Um, so I think we're, we're thinking about kind of this whole, this whole issue and how to kind of incorporate it into our standards, if, if at all. Um, I mean, most likely it, it, we could incorporate it to some extent. Um, it is somewhat incorporated in our standards uh, now, but uh, I think that we could do more work, but uh, we definitely will need to look at the results to understand you know, how that kind of plays out. And it's, that theme is definitely uh, industry specific and where the material risk is. Thanks, that's helpful. Hey, uh, Kelly, so just a, a couple a couple comments here, uh, and I know your next slide was probably going to ask about uh, questions that we had, so I'll, uh, I'll anticipate that slide, uh, or we can go go to it if you want, but um, I, but I probably, I might direct you back somewhere else anyway. Uh, so, I, you know, I think one of the questions you were going to ask is like where, you know, what questions do we have about the research process to date? And uh, I want to put this, these results into, into context a, a little bit, so I have a couple questions about that, but that yeah, I think it's important that we understand the extent to which we should draw inferences from this consultative effort, and then also think about how that fits into the broader project plan, because uh, this is just one piece, and um, uh, and so we can talk a little bit about that as well. But but on this on this specific project, um, I, I'm wondering if you've thought a little bit about um, you know just you know this is the research side of me and thinking about survey construction, and so you know in, in survey uh, research we we generally think about uh, broadly speaking, two types of, of bias. Uh, and it's like response bias and non-response bias. And that's not actually uh, a, a mirror image of each other, actually. So so non-response bias is when when people that don't respond to our survey may have different views than those who did. And a, and a response bias, you know, unfortunately, with a very similarly named uh, uh, or similar phrase there, is really around like the way in which we ask questions affecting the way people answer the questions. So. Um, just a couple uh, questions about that. Um, you know, on the non-response bias, do you have a sense for 
why people responded to, to this particular survey. Is this people that, um, you know, for example, had signed up to follow the Human Capital Project and so uh, knew about it and, or, or were there specific um, targeted efforts that we had to draw in certain types of participants? And I'm you know, just wondering like how we should sort of think about the extent to which these people might be particularly enthusiastic or partic have particularly strong opinions one way or the other around human capital. So I'll let you um, comment on that first. Sure. Uh, thanks, Jeff. I, you know, I think with the, the survey and kind of getting our universe of respondents, I think we did a great job in terms of um, trying to reach as many people as possible. SASB has several um, networks from its investor advisory group, Alliance, Standards Advisory Group. Um, so we, we canvassed all you know, all of those um, participants, um, also those that uh, signed up for the project alerts on our project page. So that may capture people that are not part of any three of those groups, um, but have a particular, you know, interest or subject matter expertise. Uh, I think we did reach out through social media as well, um, you know, through like um, LinkedIn and Twitter and things like that, um, and tried to partner with some key stakeholders like um, to kind of, share the message and then of course uh, word of mouth is very powerful so sharing that um, with people that we've interacted with to say you know please uh, here's the link please share this <laughs> with your networks um, so I, I think we've been able to get a, a good universe of, um, of canvassing there but I'm sure there's there's more we could do. <laughs> Yeah, and maybe Jeff, I can jump in a little bit too, and just just add. I think it, it is important the point that you made that this is one of many many data points that are ultimately going to inform the conclusions that we reach. And very mindful of some of the things that you mentioned around uh, response bias and even survey construction. So we're just thinking of these as a a mosaic of information that is ultimately going to enable us to make uh, the best cons the best decisions when applying our conceptual framework. So uh, completely on the same page. Yeah, and that was really going to be my second point, is putting this a little bit into the context of, I mean, you, we go all the way back to last summer, and we had the, the early hypothesis testing, mm -hmm. which uh, which actually captured some of what I think uh, Kurt was suggesting we could we could do potentially more of, but uh, having some of these dialogues. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so I know that there's there's a lot to all this, and uh, uh, you know, tracking all of the input that we engage in on a on a project is it's one of the challenges of of doing the work that we do, and I think. Uh, you know, Kelly, you know, you've got one of the bigger challenges here because this is such a big uh, effort and it's been going on for, for a while because it, it, it does have many different drivers, many different themes, uh, could it potentially affect any industry and, uh, and it happens to be something that's both evolving uh, and at a particular timeliness. And so you know, punctuated by some, some very poignant sort of things going on around us that, that captures everyone's attention. So um, I, I appreciate the, uh, the comments there. Um, Stephanie, did you want to uh, ask something or comment? Yeah, Kelly, if you could go back to the previous slide. Um, I thought the point one and point two were interesting in that it seems like there are more widespread issues and I that may vary in materiality across industry. So I'm curious, um, you know, it sounds like diversity and inclusion may be one of them. Are there other issues that you've noted that are widespread, but there are differing views on materiality? and you know, this may be too early in the process, but that would be something I'm curious about, um, at least later on after you've done some analysis. Yeah, uh, thanks, Stephanie. Yeah, I think um, in terms of, you know, just high level observations, like the DEI question is really big. I, I think that was, is a example of where we could definitely do more work, um, where it is more widespread than we had initially put in our standards. So um, there's definitely work to be done there. Um, you know, with the workforce investment question, uh, I, you know, I think there's probably more that we can do there, uh, but we do really need to understand um, what type of training is kind of like a key driver in the industry and understanding how that kind of links up with uh, corporate objectives and what they're trying to do. So that is a great example of where I think um, the issue can depend on the industry and the level of materiality. Um, you know, with the mental health uh, and worker well-being question, that's also another one that's uh, probably a great example of kind of varying by theme as well, or by industry as well, just given, um, you know, what workers are doing on a day-to-day -day basis, who's their main workforce, and, um, you know, what are the major risks. So, like, manufacturing will look different from, you know, tech 
um, you know, or what we commonly think of as tech. So it's um, it will be a really interesting to get more into the results. But I think high level, those are just some examples of um, things that we're seeing and how it can vary or uh, be more consistent <laughs> across our industries. That's really interesting. Thank you. Hi, Kelly. Um, so you said you were doing this, and I think that that's great. The 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 10Ks, in the, at least in the U.S., that just came out, that are starting for the first time to include human capital. Um, companies had to create their own, um, you know, had to create their own disclosures from from the start, uh, asserting materiality of of these topics. And so I think it'll be great and really interesting as 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 you guys review those to categorize them into the five. Um, you know, into the five themes that you're being that you're evaluating now, and to sort of see, you know, I could almost envision you'd have a whole rich database of information where you'd be able to say, well, look, companies are actually in these sectors saying that this theme is more important, and 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 that could be some good evidence for you, I would assume, going forward, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think you hit a great point, Mark. That you know, um, I feel like the the reports that the disclosures that companies provide, especially with the new uh, human capital disclosure rule, um, it will be a, a really great way to test our themes, understand what companies really find material. So I think um, to David's point, it's, that will be another data point for us going forward as we make these considerations. Uh, I know it's still kind of early days for you know companies in reporting this stuff. Uh, so you know we. We'll see what the, the data kind of shows us from this, but um, definitely something that will be an important consideration for us going forward. Okay, thanks. Great, well, um, I know that we've answered a few questions. Um, there'll definitely be more time uh, if there's more questions, but I did just want to end on this particular note just about kind of next steps for board engagement going forward. So um, I wanted to, again, just show the major milestones re uh, remaining in this project um, that are basically timed with the uh, upcoming standards board meeting. So for May, um, staff uh, plans to share with the board the full analysis of the consultation results um, and discuss any potential broad implications for the standards. Uh, July, uh, we will plan to release um, all our key deliverables, which include the finalized framework, uh, where the staff will define its views on these broad themes um, on human capital, our industry heat map, uh, which is really a tool to des a design to indicate um, staff's current thinking on how these themes manifest at an industry specific level. Uh, the last and most importantly is our initial set of uh, proposed human capital projects. So this will really signal from when the project is transitioning from research uh, to more standard setting. So um, that will be a critical turning point. Um, but of course, it, the proposed projects are proposals, so it'll be definitely contingent on the board's approval uh, so we can move forward uh, with this project. Um, however, I did want to, uh, I felt like it was important to note uh, for the board that the plan, uh, that the staff will plan to continue to hold working sessions in either small group discussions or individual engagements with board members um, in order to solicit your input on these major uh, milestones of the project. Um, and especially around the implications of the standards, which includes primarily the development of the project pipeline and the finalized framework. And these sessions will be helpful in, in moving us forward on these deliverables uh, in a meaningful way and um, to help us to continue to guide staff thinking on the project pipeline development process. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, that, actually, I was going to ask just to, for a little bit of clarity for for you know make sure everyone's on the same page with respect to these deliverables. Um, one way I think about the three is that uh, it's really the last bullet point that is going to be a standard setting activity, and so um, uh, what we might think of as like a product of the of the you know, standard setting activities of SASB. Um, but whereas the first two, I think, are going to be very helpful for uh, sharing some of our, our thoughts and, and, and the results of the engagement, but uh, not, not, not you know, affecting the standards per se. And, uh, and, and actually, so to that point, I know you, you just mentioned a little bit on this, but could you just comment a little more specifically on, on 
where you see like the, the like the data coming from for the for the industry heat map uh, you know my understanding is and just to make this really clear i think it's, like, it's not just the results of this particular survey that are going to just result in a in a heat map but it, I'll, I'll let you sort of comment on on that Sure, uh, that's a great question, Jeff. I think um, I like to think of it uh, in a couple different ways. I think the preliminary framework, um, you know, in all our research to date, kind of provides our rationale for and evidence for our, our, on the industry agnostic themes. So really, very conceptual to some degree. Um, but the analysts are really taking this framework, applying it, and figuring out how these uh, industry agnostic themes. Uh, manifest at industry specific level. So making that conversion. Um, the consultations are layered in to kind of help us understand what we can't see in the research, what really happens on the ground with companies and investors and how they're thinking about these issues. So that's another data point. Um, of course, we look at uh, CSR reports, um, other regulatory filings, um, financial reports to understand uh, where companies may fall on the materiality question. Uh, for for maybe companies we haven't heard from or um, you know haven't had a consultation with so those are all kind of data points that we're using and I hope with all of this information that will be um, a basis for um, for analysts going forward on how they want to um, propose projects related to these industry agnostic themes so my hope is that in July um, we'll have our first tranche of projects um, related to particular themes so that could be like diversity inclusion is the first theme we may want to tackle uh, and you know analysts will propose projects around that particular theme or very high priority level human capital issues in their industries and then um, we'll tackle each theme um, you know in tranches uh, so we can cover everything and hopefully um, cover our basis uh, across our 77 standards Great, thanks. That's that, that's very helpful. Um, so uh, I, I think we're about at time for for the session, and I think you got through about everything you were hoping to get through. Is there anything else that you wanted to to say to the board or or to the public? Uh, no, I just appreciate the time. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Uh, my contact information is here, and uh, just thank you to the board for all the great questions, and look forward to keeping you updated on this project. Great, uh, thank you, Kelly. So um, with that, we are uh, actually we are about at where we could jump over to the conceptual framework. Uh, since we are right on time, uh, perhaps we could take five minutes uh, and give people uh, a break before we dive into the last two hours of, uh, of, our, of our meeting. So um, um, uh, Shivani, if that's okay with you, maybe we'll, we'll pause here for, for five minutes and then, uh, and then come back. Sounds good. Great.
Shivana, can you hear me? I can. You're good. I can't hear you, so I, apparently my audio, I'll get that uh, sorted no. out. But um, why don't I go ahead and turn it back over to you? Okay. Can you hear me now or can you not? You can no. hear me now. I can hear you now. I'm sure everybody else could, but it was just my fault. Right. I can hear you now. Great, thanks. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Good to confirm. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Shivani Kakreja, and I lead the Conceptual Framework and Rules of Procedure projects here at SASB. There we go. And today I want to share a summary of the public comments that we received during the Conceptual Framework and Rules of Procedure public comment periods. But before I share that summary, I do want to make sure that everyone's familiar with the backgrounds of the projects. So I'll start off by discussing project backgrounds, objectives, and timelines. Then I will briefly discuss some of the revisions reflected in the conceptual framework and rules of procedure 2020 exposure drafts. So some of the changes that we made between 2017 and our current version of the documents. And then after that, I will provide a summary of the public comments we received, which I think everyone is waiting anxiously to hear. Um, and then we'll end by discussing next steps. So let's start with some background. And one thing that I do want to flag from the get go here is that the conceptual framework and rules of procedure are complementary documents, which is why we've grouped these two projects together. So as a reminder, the conceptual framework project aims to further strengthen the conceptual framework document, which was written in 2017 and is now a bit outdated. So by the end of the conceptual framework project, everyone should expect a revised conceptual framework document that will help guide the work of the research team and of the standards board, and will also effectively communicate SASB's thinking to external stakeholders. And then similar to the conceptual framework project, the rules of procedure project aims to further strengthen the rules of procedure document, which was also written in 2017 and is also a bit outdated. And so by the end of the rules of procedure project, everyone should expect a revised rules of procedure document that focuses on detailing our project based model and due process and helps communicate how external stakeholders can engage with SASB. And for both the conceptual framework and rules of procedure projects, we've really come a long way since I first presented both projects to the standards board for approval in September of 2019. So after spending almost a year revising the documents, thanks to help from staff members, from foundation board members, from the entire standards board, we were able to expose both drafts for public comment in late August of last year. So both the conceptual framework and the rules of procedure underwent public comments from April, from, excuse me, August 28th through December 31st of last year, which allowed external stakeholders like everyone dialed in to provide feedback on the revised versions of the documents. But before I get into the summary of public comments we received, I want to provide a brief overview of the revisions found in the 2020 conceptual framework and rules of procedure exposure drafts so that everyone can get a sense of the changes that have already been proposed before we discuss some more suggested changes that were found in the public comments that we received. So let's briefly talk through the revisions that were made prior to the start of the public comment periods. So in the 2020 Rules of Procedure Exposure Draft, you'll see SASB's updated mission statement, more clarity around SASB's standard setting due process, and a section dedicated to communicating how external stakeholders can engage with SASB. You'll also notice that much of the conversation on roles and responsibilities has been moved to the appendix. In the 2020 conceptual framework exposure draft, you'll see SASB's updated mission statement, more detail around our global applicability and our place in the sustainability disclosure landscape, and a revised definition of financial materiality, revised fundamental tenets, and revised characteristics for topic and metric selection. 
So I hope that briefly going through all of these revisions thus far helps ground everyone in where we were and where we are now so that we might better understand where we may need to go in the future. Kurt, do you have a question? Yeah, hey, Shivani, um, just trying to refresh my and maybe the audience's memory a little bit about, you know, we did change the mission statement and a couple other, what are some of the big content changes, I guess, if you had to recap, how, how did really these two documents change versus two years ago? How would you recap it? Yeah, so I think for the conceptual framework, um, we really try to think through what is most important to people nowadays. So I think we spent a lot of time in our conceptual framework in 2017 discussing why sustainability disclosure is important. And I think that has already been established. And so now we spend a lot of time discussing where SASB fits in the disclosure landscape. So that's one big thing. Um, we also proposed a revised definition of financial materiality. Another big thing, the scope of financial materiality that we care about at SASB has not changed since 2017, but the language that we use to communicate our definition has changed. Um, so those are big things. We also added transparency as a fundamental tenet. Um, that was not a fundamental tenet before, though it was, um, you know, it's always been important to us. Um, right. So nothing there has changed drastically, um, but that has been added as a fundamental tenet. Jeff, do you want to add anything in here? I see you popped on. Yeah, well, maybe, uh, you know, a couple of big picture thoughts would be that um, it, the these documents have been around for a while. I mean, the most recent version, definitely 2017, but the earlier versions all the way back to 2013, I think. And so um, they, they've they evolved over time. And, and part of it is, uh, you know, how we talk about the way that we engage in the work that we do so that you know, we, people can understand that process. So part of it is around communication and part of it is also around actually the governance of uh, our activities as well as the guidance of our thinking, you know, rules of procedure versus conceptual framework. And so, you know, I think, you know, a lot of the, this was meant to communicate more clearly to the marketplace around what we do and why we do it. And, uh, and that means using some language that's more common today than it was maybe five, 10 years ago, as well as starting to reflect um, how we fit relative to other standard setting organizations. If we use a, a word or a phrase and most other organizations use a different word or a phrase, we should probably think about whether we should be using the same one. Um, but, and if we use the same one, we should think about whether we should be using the same one if we actually mean something different by it. And so uh, that's some of what we tried to accomplish is better alignment. Um, we will we'll see, uh, you know, you know, spoiler alert, that, that there's still some progress to, to go in that respect as well. But, um, yeah. but that's a bit how I think of it, so trying to clarify and simplify as well as align. Yeah, and I guess the, uh, you know, some of this is a moving target. You look at the incredible evolution of the group of five, the alphabet soup, you know, IFRS, this, this whole global convergence, is, you know, is creating real a real momentum that it seems like it's hard for us to even keep up with how we contextualize how we fit into this ecosystem. So. Well, that's right. And I don't expect this work to ever be done. Uh, you know, I, I, I teach conceptual frameworks as part of my class, uh, you know, at the, at the university. And one of the things I like to tell my students is that uh, the early thinking on these conceptual frameworks in financial accounting were developed before Star Wars, you know, just to like, that's how old it is. It doesn't seem old to you and me, Kurt, but like to other people, it seems yeah. like very old, but they're continuing to work on it. And it, it's just because to your point, this is a, it's a moving target conversation, communication uh, needs change over time. And we try to reflect that. Jeff, I may need to sign up for your course. My my lack of understanding of it is obvious. So uh, <laughs> you're welcome. We won't tell anybody. <laughs> Thanks, Kurt. All right. Thanks, Giovanni. All right. So let's dive into public comments. So as I mentioned earlier, the conceptual framework and rules of procedure 2020 exposure drafts with all of the revisions that we just talked about were published on our website for everyone to see and provide feedback on for the latter half of last year. And over the course of the public comment periods, we received 30 comment letters. Everyone who provided comments commented on the conceptual framework 2020 exposure draft, and many of those people also provided comments on the rules of procedure 2020 exposure draft. 
Most commenters provided comments that directly responded to many or to all of the 12 questions that we posed in our invitation to comment. And all of the comments that we received can be found on the conceptual framework and rules of procedure project pages on SASB's website. And I really do encourage people to read through the comment letters on our website because they are all so thoughtful and they bring such an interesting perspective. Um, so thank you to the investors, the corporations, so many other groups, um, accounting firms, all associations, um, and so many others for providing feedback on the conceptual framework and rules of procedure exposure drafts. You all provided such a range of views for us to consider, and there was so much depth in each of your letters, and we really do look forward to discussing each and every one of your comments. But today, rather than going through each comment individually, I do want to provide a summary of the comments that we received. So I'll start by discussing each of the key themes that you see here on the slides. And then I also want to touch upon the comments we received in response to two key invitation to comment questions, one relating to financial materiality and one relating to the characteristics. Jeff, yeah, do you have Shivani, a yeah, maybe before we jump into the, the themes, could we talk a little bit about um, um, just the, the, the number of comment letters that were received and, and the mix of the comment letters, maybe if going back a slide or, uh, or so. So um, you know, 30, 30 comment letters and um, uh, you know, maybe just some, some context uh, around that. I mean, I know that there was targeted outreach as well. Um, it, conceptual frameworks are by their nature uh, wonky and, and rules of procedure are technical wonky. And so, uh, you know, like especially so. So I'm not, I'm not too surprised to see the relative amounts. And, you know, like if we were to contrast this with the IFRS Foundation's, uh, you know, uh, uh, their consultation summary on on creating a standards board, they got 500 plus uh, comment letters, which, you know, so that that's, you know, a, a huge difference in number. But um, but just to put that a bit into context, the, you know, like the IESB wouldn't typically get 500 comments on, uh, on, on a conceptual framework um, public comment period. They might only get like, you know, 15 or 30 or something like that. So so in some sense, like, you know, there's just different topics. Uh, and, and so we should be thinking about it that way. But I wonder is if you could if you could talk a little bit about like who we were hoping to hear, like in terms of like, you know, you don't have to get into maybe too many specific organizations, but in terms of like the targeted outreach, how do we sort of think about this and, uh, and what do we hear back in that respect? Sure, yeah. So we reached out to a number of different um, stakeholders that we definitely wanted to hear from. Uh, we reached out to the big four, to IFAC, to a number of others. Um, maybe you can fill in the blanks there, Jeff or Brian. Um, but we did hear back from everyone that we reached out to. Some provided um, off the record comments. So we did actually hear back from them, but their comments may not be reflected on our website. Um, but we were really happy with who we heard back from. And it's a pretty even split, as you can see here, um, between investors and companies. Um, and of course, we will continue to reach out to different groups of people. And so I think this is an ongoing um, you know, research in that sense. And so hopefully we can help bring the 20 to 30, 20 and 30 closer together um, and also hear from more, you know, standard setting organizations. Jeff, just a little. Just a little more to build on that. We always have um, some uh, priority stakeholders in mind that we really think are experts in a certain topic that we might do some targeted outreach to. And it's fantastic when we get those kind of thoughtful, robust responses from those uh, types of organizations or individuals that are true experts in a, in a certain topic like the conceptual framework or uh, rules of procedure for that matter. Uh, really importantly though, and part of the value of doing a public comment period, is it's always really exciting for staff and for the board to get a number of comments from other other stakeholders that are following the project that have an interest in the project and there were quite a number of those as well so it's just the public transparency the public nature of the the comment period adds a lot of value to our process i can say with uh with most definitely with confidence that um many comments received um from folks that we didn't do targeted outreach to adds add a lot of value to our thinking and bringing forward new options, new ideas. So just the value of that public nature of this part of the process. And then one other comment is that staff is constantly conducting um, you know, one on one consultations really at any phase of a project. And that's to be expected. That's consistent with 
our objectives of just kind of one of many tactics to kind of broadly build out our understanding, build out our views on any certain uh, subject matter. And just given how influential the conceptual framework and the rules of procedure are for our standard setting process, the board can continue to uh, expect that those types of uh, ongoing consultations to continue. One example is when a respondent, um, an, an organization that submits a public comment letter, um, uh, provides a letter, uh, we might have some follow-up consultations with them to really make sure we understand the nature of their comments, we're interpreting them correctly, we're asking follow-up questions, and, and so forth. So uh, the comment period is, is as you know, really, really important part of our process. Um, and at that, and with that said, it's it's part of the process, but it's not the entirety of the process. Yeah, I appreciate the 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 context there, um, and I totally agree with everything that both of you said. Uh, you know, in my impression, we had uh, you know really great, very thoughtful comments that we received, and it wasn't like they came only from one type of respondent, but you know, it came from companies, associations, uh, you know, different firms, the investors, and so. Um, uh, and, and you know, frankly, I was I was really pleased. It's always great when there is investor engagement, um, you know, because it, I think just historically in standard setting it can be difficult to get investors to to engage compared to you know the firms that are more directly affected by the you know, the nature of standards. Um, uh, but but we we got that feedback. I think that is great, um, and in particular on conceptual issues, which again you might think of as being more of a, a wonky topic that might not be uh, of as great interest to. Uh, to some of our stakeholders, but uh, but anyway, I appreciate I appreciate that that just as some uh, context for how to interpret the numbers, and I I was pretty pleased actually with uh, with what we've heard back. So thanks. Likewise. Great, thank you both. All right, so let's talk through these key themes. All right, so the first key theme is support for the revision of the documents and the direction in which these documents are headed. The second key theme that we heard across all of the comments we received is encouragement for further clarity, more structural change, and scope changes. And the third key theme is encouragement for further connection to or alignment with the IASB. So let's dive into each of these themes a bit more. So for the first theme of support, I wanna note that no letters we received questioned why SASB is revising the conceptual framework and rules of procedure, and all letters agreed with the general direction in which our revisions are headed. So for example, no one said that they did not understand why we wanted to make our documents more globally applicable. So on this slide, you'll see quotes from the beginnings of Bank of America's and KPMG's comment letters. If you do look through other letters, you'll notice that a lot of them start out like this. There was a lot of support. So this serves as a really helpful, um, as really helpful and positive feedback for us as an organization. It's especially helpful, I think, to get market confirmation or respondent confirmation on the direction in which these revisions are headed. Now here's where we get to the constructive feedback. And do keep in mind these bullets on this slide here are just examples we received hundreds of other comments that could be showcased on this slide. But overall, the constructive feedback we received can be bucketed into three categories. So there's clarity, there's structural change, and there's scope. When we say clarity, we mean that we received comments asking us to clarify or further detail certain terms or topics. When we say structural change, we mean that respondents ask for topics or terms to be removed from or added to the document. So these are a little larger scale than just clarity related changes. And lastly, scope changes are asking us to reevaluate the scope of certain terms we use or of our processes. So at the top here under clarity, you'll see that we are being asked to further discuss our stance on governance. Under scope, you'll see that we are also being asked to add corporate governance related topics and metrics into our standards. For structural change, it suggested that we exclude transparent as a fundamental tenet and we remove understandable as a characteristic for metric selection. So Jeff, I'll let you chime in here and I also wanna give everyone a moment to read through these and ask any questions that you may have. Yeah, thank, thanks, Giovanni. So, um, you know, so 
one way to think about if you know the the the, the buckets here is um, you know uh, is through the lens of our due process because um, you know to the extent that uh, people agree with the change and they're just looking you know they have a suggestion for how to word something more clearly or they have a question around what we mean by something then uh, you know it, it's relatively easy for us to to think about that change and to the extent that we implement it um, you know confirm that that's what was needed and uh, and not necessarily invoke a ton of due process uh, as a result of, of doing that change. A structural change is a little trickier because these types of changes tend to be um, not just a clarification around what we intended previously, but but in fact, maybe asking us to, to think about the documents differently, right? Change something in the, in the nature of it. And so, um, you know, there, if we, we, you know, if we decide to make those changes, uh, depending on the magnitude of the structural change that we're looking at, I think that that does lend itself to potentially the need to, to re-expose uh, a document for additional feedback, because with structural changes, it's not always obvious that the feedback that we got could have really commented on or give us, you know, the level of comfort that we would like that 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 this type of change would actually be supported by the marketplace, and, and so uh, so that would require potentially a bit more due process, but still well within the scope of of the board's remit. Um, the scope, though, the scope type of questions are are the types of questions that we get, and you know, this is like we we often get these types of comments regardless of the public comment period. But there, there are people that want us to do something differently, uh, and and that may, in fact, mean uh, quite big changes to what we're talking about, a fundamental change to our approach, how we do you know, the, the process that we use to do standard setting, the way that we uh, try to identify what topics we're going to cover in our standards. Um, uh, you know, could even be like around changing the mission of the organization in some respect. So you know, we'll, we'll have some time to dive into some of these comments, but, uh, but, but fairly big and not necessarily even under the control of the standards board per se, because it might affect actually the, you know, the organizational structure of SASB and our mission. So uh, uh, just to give some context for the, for the, for those three buckets and uh, I appreciate you walking through that. Um, Mark, um, you have a comment, question? Yeah, Jeff, I, I, I agree with the way that you explain it. I, I was just thinking that, uh, you know, some of the, the comments made on, on, on structural change uh, partly also uh, overlap with clarity because I saw a number of, of comments being made like yeah be very specific on the objective that you have for the uh, the conceptual framework versus the uh, objective of the, the rules of procedure right and i think again with my maybe ifrs experience in conceptual framework is there to guide the uh, the board on uh, on its individual standard setting processes uh, whenever you have an individual standard okay well go back to the the basic concepts whereas rules of procedures is much more uh, uh, like the due process handbook uh, i guess uh, at the isb where you really lay out your um you, 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 the steps that you take in the process and the engagement uh, that, that stakeholders have with the organization and the process and i you know, I saw some comments made, and I had some sympathy with them, saying sometimes that is uh, there is a bit of overlap in in two of the documents. Which I don't know how you would classify that, uh, uh, Jeff. Whether you would say that that is structural change, or whether it is actually just providing more clarity as to the, you know, the the objective and the purpose of both documents. Yeah, it's an interesting point, Mark. I, you know, I hadn't really thought of it like this way before, but but the clearly, clarity, structural change, and scope are related, and I think they're they're like directionally related in that you can uh, clarify without having the other implications, but it's very difficult to have a structural change or a scope change that doesn't sort of embody the the, con the, the categories above it in a sense. So there's a bit of a hierarchy uh, here for sure. Um, and in terms of the documents, if we were to, and we can, uh, I know that there was a, we, we asked specifically a, a question around whether the documents are appropriate and, uh, and, and complementary. And so uh, it's definitely something that we're going to be thinking more about. We can, we can certainly comment on some of the feedback that we got on that um, whenever um, and however Shimani wants to lead that conversation but um, uh, it's a it's a good question and I think you know it's it it seems to me a bit more like a structural change of the documents as opposed to uh, maybe a scope change if, if it's just really about clarifying it um, um, you know, again we can get into this a little bit later but um, uh, yeah. You know, there's definitely a bit of an overlap by design originally, but not necessarily as clear as it could be. Um, and we could we could certainly address that. Yeah, and I thought transparency was a good example because it's on the slide here. Because transparency is one obviously that is a comment about how we conduct conduct our process, right? It's uh, and it it's not about 
you know the standard itself that you develop clearly that also should add to transparency in the market but it's a different transparency i think that we have in mind here that that uh, sees the process but anyway i don't want to to go into that detail but i think it was just to to clarify the point i was making yeah yeah thanks mark Kurt? yeah on a much more simplistic maybe some low-hanging fruit the very bottom comment there really is just asking for our process to be tweaked to have more opportunities for stakeholder engagement. So um, mm. that, that one almost doesn't fit as scope, I guess. I didn't see the specific on it, Shivani, but it just seems like, you know, there, there must be some input that people are looking for an easier way to engage with us. And maybe that's before they saw our new and improved website. I don't know. Sure, Kurt, that's actually a good segue into how the staff is thinking about this, is that we have uh, the rules of, of procedure similar to, as Mark just mentioned, the ISB uh, due process handbook that lays out the very formal steps in due process um, around what's required in order, or what should be done rather, in order to um, update a standard. There's going to be a lot more detail underneath that in terms of the specific tax tactics and yeah. processes to execute and really bring that rules of procedure into practice. So one of the questions we want to ask ourselves is what level of detail and what level of clarity is appropriate in the, the, the rules of procedure versus that kind of underlying detail that can be really positioned in a way which we're working on, as you referenced, Kurt, to be helpful to our constituents, to be helpful to companies and investors and um, subject matter experts in engaging the process. And so I certainly think there might be some more opportunities to improve what is explicitly uh, stated in, in the rules of procedure. And I think we should also recognize at the outset that there'll be more detail underneath that that can be available in the, in the website and other communication and educational materials and, and, and so forth. And some of the public comment letters recognize that themselves. They even sometimes suggested additional clarity and then recognized that perhaps that additional clarity is more appropriate in other resources. Again, maybe calling back to the, the website is just one kind of simple common example. Yeah, I, I kind of got a chuckle, Shivani, when you were revealing that uh, this whole issue that half the audience wants more detail and half the audience wants clarity and being very succinct. So it's uh, navigating that balance is, uh, is the trick, I guess. Absolutely. It's like the, the the comments my students give at the end of the semester, right? The, some of them want you know, easier exams, some of them want harder exams, and uh, you know, go faster, go slower. Uh, it's you know, it's, it's very difficult. But um, you know, what? Just a little bit of history too on this. I, I mentioned that uh, you know the conceptual framework first draft of it was back in like 2013, I think. And uh, I, so I'm pretty like somebody could have to fact check me on this, but I think that our first conceptual framework preceded our first rules of procedure and. Um, and uh, and so in some ways, and the conceptual framework is a more prominent document that people look at because many standard setting organizations, um, uh, you know, many of those framework developers that are out there don't have the same sort of due process that, uh, that we've tried to, to implement. Uh, we did try to emphasize that early on and we did it in the conceptual framework. And so the, a bit of this is that like, you know, historically we've included a discussion of process along with uh, the, the concepts uh, because it helps people to understand what we do, and um, I think what we're hearing now is, you know, good good questions about whether that's still appropriate and how best to actually, uh, you know, uh, make sure people understand what we do and and, and how we do it and uh, and where to find that information. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jeff. And there's more on that in the appendix, so if we have time, I'll get to that as well. Just trying to advance the slide here. All right. Um, so one thing that I do want to mo note is most of the clarity and structure and scope related changes that we feedback, excuse me, that feedback that we received would get us closer to aligning with the IASB, but many respondents explicitly suggested in their comment letters that SASB align more with or connect more to the IASB. So on this slide, you'll see that theme and a sample of comments that we received relating to that. So we received a number of comments asking that SASB's conceptual framework be more aligned with the IASB's conceptual framework. We also received comments asking that SASB's and the IASB's definition of decision useful be aligned, for example. 
Um, so I'll give you all a moment to read through these and then feel free to ask any questions or share any thoughts that you guys have. So, you know, I'm just so full of thoughts and comments about conceptual frameworks, but um, so, um, you know, but I think, you know, the way I, the way I take this is um, um, through, through a couple uh, perspectives, I suppose, but one, one way to think about this is that, that there are um, increasingly, I think, uh, stakeholders that are, are representing the you know, financial accounting, traditional corporate governance, you know, a perspective that hasn't necessarily been, you know, five or 10 years ago, really interested in the work that we're doing. And so they're coming into the, to the, the, the conversation and very interested in trying to connect back to uh, the perspectives that they're used to. And, and that makes a lot of sense. And there's been a lot of good work that's been done in financial accounting uh, by the ISB and, and by the FASB, actually, even before that in the U.S. Uh, and so I think that's, you know, it's, it's both understandable and I think also uh, appropriate that we, you know, that, that we try to think about how we're aligning with, um, uh, you know, more traditional ways of thinking about uh, the conceptual framework for financial accounting. Um, you know, I, I, I do think that um, one of the challenges here is that uh, we're, we're trying to accomplish something which is to communicate to all of our stakeholders and so we do have a lot of people that are interested in sustainability information that aren't necessarily um, you know accounting experts per se and so may not you know that that language one may not be the language that they're used to hearing either and so we're trying to bridge uh, a gap here and um, and I think the other challenge is that like that we are trying to do something that is a bit different than than what financial accounting standard setters are trying to do as well where you know they're thinking about, uh, you know, in, in many cases, thinking about like the, the, the boundaries of financial statements, what's going to go into, uh, a, you know, a, a statement of financial position, a, a profit loss statement. And so thinking about things that can be measured in currency units, measured a particular way. And that's important. And, and, you know, and they have a good conceptual framework for doing that. Some of those concepts, I think, are very useful for us. But uh, but we also have other things that we're trying to do because we have to capture measurements that aren't going to be you know, easily or even appropriately measured in currency units, for example, and uh, and there may be more than one at performance metric needed to kind of capture um, uh, a topic that that's of interest. And so, so I think this is a bit of what we uh, are understanding better as a result of this public comment period. The need to to do a better job of of connecting what is the same, what can be the same, and, and maybe where there's some some gaps there as well. Lloyd. Well, and Jeff, I maybe you can expand and um, Shivani as well on sort of the practical output of this process will be a document, but it seems like there's a real, almost a slider or a trade-off here. Uh, on the right, one hand, we could write a very short, succinct SASB-centric document that says, this is what SASB is, this is what SASB does. At the other end, we could write a document that really strives to align well with you know, a multitude. There's this incredible, uh, proliferation of standards and, and statements. And so it seems like we do, we can't do one or the other. We do have to find a middle ground. And you guys have been working this process for a while. And so I'm curious what you've observed and where you're coming down on, where do we strike that balance? I think we'll get into a lot of this with next steps because we do plan to outline some of these more some of these larger, perhaps more strategic questions, like with the IFRS consultation, do we want to wait to hear what they've received and to see what they do, or do we want to continue to revise these documents based on that? So we'll definitely we'll definitely be somewhere in the middle, but I think there are so many larger questions that we have yet to answer as an organization. Um, and once we answer those, so in the coming you know, a few months, then we'll have a much better sense of where we're landing between those two extremes. Right, because SASB's yep. changing as well. Absolutely. That's right. Um, I, so I have a, th a thought on that. Mark, uh, I wanted to give you a chance if you wanted to jump in on this or you had something different. Um... 
Okay, I'm going to take that. I can't hear you. I think you're on mute, but I'll take that hand gesture as being it was maybe something slightly different. It, it was slightly different, so I let you, uh, you respond first to, to Lloyd. Excellent. My my sign language is actually pretty good, or my body language reading is pretty good. Um, yeah. So so Lloyd, I think a little uh, about this a little bit through the lens of something we had talked about earlier in the meeting today um, with respect to the prototype for uh, uh, a climate related financial disclosure and um, and 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 how we've been as part of that group of five effort. Uh, trying to think about connectivity to financial, traditional financial accounting conceptual frameworks, and um, you know, that again, like that, that was a process that started after we had already, um, you know, gone through a years of effort uh, uh, on this particular project, and so, um, so, so that benefited from some of the thinking here, but also from the thinking uh, of you know, um, you know, the other groups of, uh, in on that uh, effort, and. One way I think about this is that we should probably take a look at, at that group effort and think about how that can inform what we're doing for SASB specifically. I don't think we just want to like, um, I, I, I'm not sure it's, it's, it's right or appropriate for us to just sort of like plop it into our conceptual framework and say, we're the owner of this thing. Um, and, and currently there isn't really an owner of it. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a collective effort on a, a but not a, not a due process document. And so, uh, I think we can think about the extent to which, you know, it, certainly even part of it, like the, the sustainability half of it uh, relates to the way that we talk about what we do. And, and so that, you know, if that does end up getting traction, that it, it, it ends up being something where people can then clearly see like, well, through that lens of, you know, which is really kind of a diamond where there's some overarching themes at the top that that cover any type of disclosure, particularly for the capital markets. And then, you know, if it's going to go into uh, a debit credit system and, and, and be part of something denominated in currency units, it's one particular uh, path. And the other side uh, could be more for the activities that relate to things that aren't necessarily assets or liabilities yet, you know, and aren't easily measurable in currency units and, and think about the concepts that would help that process. Uh, and then, you know, the, the diamond closes with some concepts around um, a presentation and disclosure. And so, uh, again, could be potentially relatively universal there. So thinking about that structure might help us to, to, to write our conceptual framework in a way that would connect better to, to financial accounting standards centers. So when we talk about harmonization, maybe more conceptual harmonization than necessarily linguistic harmonization, looking for ways to structure this, because we're in this liminal space, we're in between things. And so you sort of have to put one, one foot down in one area and one in another, and then find a way to integrate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's non-trivial, both the conceptual and the, the linguistic aspect of it. I mean, like the words matter and the, the concepts under, uh, that, that, that sit underneath them matter and uh, it will shape how we think and how people think of us. So, you know, it's, we, we have a bit of a challenge ahead of us, but I think it's a, you know, I'm enthusiastic about the effort. <laughs> Thanks, okay. Yeah. Yeah, Jeff. My, my my question was more when I when I read this, I I have a lot of sympathy for for uh, you know the alignment with uh, with the ISB comments that that are coming through. But it it also raised a question in my mind when I was reading all this: um, whether we have a view or whether we should have a view on 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 kind of placement of of information, if you know what I mean, right? Because here we say general purpose financial statements. Okay, that's clear. That's very defined. Right, but uh, but uh, sustainability reporting can be at very different levels and different uh, parts of of a um, you know uh, of a uh, of, of a, uh, a statement or, or could also be a CSR report, but could be in management commentary. And to a certain extent, I think it matters. Uh, you know, the alignment as to where you would see this ultimately end up. Um, and I don't know, Shivani, whether comments have been made. In, in, in I think there were a few comments on, uh, there were. on there this. Were. And I, and I guess this is this is one of the the elements that at least would clarify in my mind uh, a bit, you know, ultimately where you want to go with the alignment as well. Because if you see it as really integrated part, you know, of a uh, an integrated report that that serves the same audience, right, it may give me a different answer than if it is actually, you know, much more uh, a specific report on CSR, for example. At least in my mind, it could be different. Yeah. It's a it's a it's a great it's a great point, Mark. And I think one of the things that we've uh, certainly that I've I've noticed as part of this entire process is that that you know traditional financial accounting because of the 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 format in which those reports are created and who they were originally intended for 
there's a lot of overlap in the sense of like, if you say financial statements, there's implied who is going to be using them. If you say investors, you know, you kind of, you know, financial statements are going to be part of that process. And so, so there's a bit of a convenience there around uh, the, the channel and there's a bit of like well understood overlap between the channel and the user, um, which is, of course, we benefit uh, in that clarity because of all the conceptual work that's been done by the accounting organizations historically. Um, that's just not the thing that we've had in the past with sustainability um, uh, reporting. And so one of the things that we've focused on a lot over the years is, is communicating around audience. Um, and you know we've had a lot of comments and thought over the over the years as well on like location or channel and um, um, and you're exactly right like there are more channels for this type of information uh, and there are more stakeholders and so you know it is a thing for us to be thinking about in our conceptual framework to what extent we want to be clear around how the concepts relate to um, not only who but potentially you know where and we've, we we did get some comments and questions about that. Yeah, and it's also in, in combination with the, the RSC uh, merger, right, where I guess you're thinking about integrated reporting. Uh, yeah, that, that, that provides an extra dimension to think about, uh, probably. And Mark, yeah. I guess just two cents on that. I mean, historically, SASB was kind of in a, in a checkmate situation. As we talked about initially, this being a part of financial reporting, there were a lot of concerns about from the legal side what goes into the 10K and all of that. And I think, you know, one of the things that really freed this movement was saying, we're gonna be, you know, agnostic to location. Right. Get the information out, make sure it's credible. And so I would be very hesitant to try to enter that. Although to your point with the IARC and those other things, there may be convergence, but I think, you know, we, we made a huge positive step to stop spinning our wheels fighting that battle that it has to be in the 10K or it has to be here. And so I, at least right now, to me, it feels still premature to force the financial reporting people to embed that in, in traditional financial reporting. So. Right. And, and supporting that echoing and supporting that idea is that we also know that investors look to many more places beyond financial reports to get information to make uh, decisions about how to um, lend or invest. Right. Right. Just, yeah, just so one, oh, go ahead, Brian. Yeah. Sure, just one follow-up observation from spending a lot of time reviewing the comment letters that I don't necessarily want to take for granted. And this is, I think, the direction that you were going, Jeff, is that there was an overwhelming clarity in the responses around the understanding that the investor is the primary user and yeah. that the SASB standards are designed to solicit information that are, are connected to enterprise value creation. And so um, I think that, well, Mark, that doesn't answer your question in terms of location of disclosures. It's, a, it's, it's something I don't necessarily want to take for granted because there is no controversy as far as I can recall and no debate around the, the, the clarity and the understanding on the investor audience and enterprise value creation. Um, that might even be a segue to the next topic that Shivani has planned here around financial materiality. But um, Jeff, if you wanted to add anything else on that, go right ahead. Well, you know, I think of the, the value of, of disclosure, you know, you know, from an accounting perspective, I think of this all as being about like accountability. Um, you know, so, so, you know, you, when you start to think about how can information facilitate accountability, you have to answer the question of to whom and for what. And so you know, our conceptual framework has to be crystal clear on, on those issues of to whom and for what. And, uh, um, and I think we, we've gotten some comments, maybe a few more comments on that. Well, have you got the for what right, you know, or, or the right way to frame it or, 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 or talk about it? But, but the, you know, Brian, to your point, the to whom has been crystal clear. But to Mark's point as well, like, you know, the, the importance of the, the, Location, you know, in some ways can also be thought of as ease of use, usability. It can be thought of as in terms of like the, the quality of the information that, that's likely to, you know, the, the controls that go into it uh, and, and assurance. And, and so to that point, like we did get questions also around how we might think about making sure that, that the information that comes out of using our standards also, is also of high quality. And, and so I'm thinking about some of the questions around assurability, for example. And, uh, and so as I think about the you know, questions people might have around location, I, to me, there are also questions around assurability and, and where and in what ways do we try to make sure that we're providing guidance um, for 
those who are implementing our, our standards and our guidance to, to be able to produce the type of information that investors need. And so you know, some of that can come through application guidance. Some of it uh, can come through other um, you know, best practices that we might put out there and showcase. But, uh, but some of it for sure is going to be in the way that we think about what are the types of topics and, and, and metrics that are going to lend themselves lend themselves to high quality disclosure and so um you know just to say like point well taken mark that we do need to be thinking about not just to whom and for what but but how we can make sure that it's it's usable and uh and high quality John, so, did you have a follow up go ahead mark no 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 i was just uh, i was just going to agree because that was the point i wanted to make i didn't want to 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 put it in a certain direction it's just uh, that we, we we take the topic and, and think about it and, and partly triggered by the fact also that uh, you know we talked briefly about the uh, the, the european uh, exercise right that is is actually thinking also about you know how to how to, to structure and where this information needs to to come right and i think so certainly if 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 sasb centers are going to play a role in in that context as well i think it, it we, we need to give it thought that that was the only point thanks absolutely yeah thanks mark maybe just before we turn to financial materiality on the next slide jeff i'm glad you raised the application guidance because there were uh, there was there were comments received that are um not only feedback for us to consider around the conceptual framework but then more directly around the application guidance, just noting that staff receives so many questions from uh, companies as they're looking to implement the standards or in the process of implementation around these aspects, not just location of disclosures, but more specifically around the governance, internal controls, assurance, and, and so forth. And so we do take positions in the application guidance, um, you know, for example, around how disclosures should be, or the controls that oversee disclosures and govern disclosures should be substantially similar to those used for financial reporting. Um, there are, there's an interconnection and interplay here between the conceptual framework and the application guidance, but I think, I think us kind of keeping this theme in mind and trying to be really clear to avoid conflating the two documents. And um, um, it's, it's gonna be important as we, as we carry forward and uh, think about some of these comments that related to, 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 to really both the objectives of both, both different documents. Yep, absolutely. Thanks, Brian. All right, let's get to financial materiality. So as we were hoping would be the case, we received a number of thoughtful responses regarding our proposed definition of financial materiality. These responses fell into these three main categories. So the first category is that our proposed definition is strong and perhaps could use some further revision, so more clarity related feedback. The second type of feedback we received was that SASB's definition of financial materiality should further align with the IISB's definition of materiality. And currently the definitions encompass the same scope, but SASB would need to reword its definition to align with the IISB's. And lastly, we received a couple of comments stating that we do not need to explicitly define financial materiality from a SASB perspective because it is already defined by other organizations or it's alluded to within our objective of being decision useful. Any thoughts here? Any questions? Anything to add, Jeff or Brian? Uh, you know, I, I, I've got thoughts. I think, you know, um, you know it's, 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 this is a, materiality is always a big kind of thorny issue. So I'll, I'll actually, um, I'll, I'll hold back on my thoughts. I'm curious to hear what, what Mark and Dan have to say. Thanks. Um, so, so yeah, my head was swirling as I was reading through all these comments. Um, this is not my first rodeo with materiality, um, but it occurs to me, you know, I'm, I, I think the categories that you that you hit on are are, are pretty well right. Um, they they were sort of the same ones that fit in my head. I mean, CCR's letter said, "Do what TCFD said. Recognize that materiality is defined by jurisdiction." EY's letter said, "You don't need it at all," and I'll get back to that. Um, um, you know, CalPERS said align with the IASB and PwC said align with either the FASB or the IASB. Note that the FASB and the IASB don't align today. Um, they did, and then the FASB changed it. Um, you know, so so this is not, you know, there's also a great document on the corporate reporting dialogue site that, that puts all the different people's definitions of materiality together. But what this sort of, it made me sort of step back and question all of this 
and 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 what what our objective is in using materiality and why and this jeff goes back to your comment on the last slide which is should this be different from financial reporting and if so why and 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 i wonder because in financial reporting the standard setters prescribe a standard um, not using materiality, but they prescribe a standard and the entities, the issuers actually have, you look at materiality on an entity specific basis using their own um, facts and circumstances to decide whether that is material for them and whether to respond to it or, or to include it in their financial statements. We use materiality completely differently as a filter of the 100 or 200 ESG issues which ones are the ones that we think are going to be more relevant in each particular sector. That's a very different use in my mind of materiality. And, and we use the same word and I'm not sure, you know, so, so it just causes me to step back and really question what's the objective? Is the objective the same and therefore is alignment right? Should we not use it when other people are using it? So, so honestly, this raised more questions to me than, than, um, than solutions. I mean, there were a lot of yeah. solutions, but but it, it raised a lot of questions to me, fundamental questions. No, uh, there's great 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 points, Mark, and and this sort of echoes back to the the point I was making earlier that like yeah. there are there are times where we use different words and we should use the same one, and there are times where we use the same word but we actually may mean something different. And so, um, you, you, we have historically focused on aspects of like talking about financial materiality because. We're trying to bring people along in this conversation around what we are not referring to and what we are referring to. But you're exactly right that we use this approach to sort of filter the universe of possible issues that we could talk about. And so um, it's a it's it is a challenge. We do acknowledge that that materiality at the end of the day is a function of regional jurisdictions and is not only entity specific, but it's but it's but it's it's item specific, right? Like it's situation specific. And, and and so we're not, you know, we're not claiming that that's not the case. And um, no, but that's actually, what's driving. That's a driving in part the the variety of responses that you get because the perspectives that are coming from people who use the materiality in the way that they use materiality. So that that's partly why you get this wide variety of people's opinions about how we should be defining it when we're not necessarily doing the same thing that they're trying to do, even though we do acknowledge that it, that is different. Yep. Yeah, that's a, it's a it's a great point. Yeah, we we don't use relevance, um, you know, which which with the financial accounting standard setters do focus on. It's like we're going to focus on what's relevant, you know, and then you know materiality will play into whether or not you actually have to kind of comply with with the with the rule in a sense. But um, uh, I don't think we had the ability, probably historically, to just say relevant and have people know that what we meant was something that relates to financially material right. sustainability information. Um, whether we're there yet or not, I think this is certainly part of what the conversation's going to have to be. And I'll be curious, like what the what the board opinion happens to be about this, you know, individual opinions, and and you know as we dig through this, uh, it's a big it's a big important question. Uh, Dan, you've been you've been hanging out here for a little while, so uh, I do want to make sure you get a chance to chime in. Oh well, well yeah, I was thinking, and in, in some ways, you and Mark covered the point that I wanted to make in your dialogue just now, it seems to me that we have to have a concept of materiality. I mean, you guys use the word filter, I was gonna say a, a, a yardstick, but our, our staff and our board need some way of measuring po possible disclosure topics to determine whether they're material in our context, particularly because we operate in a world where there's double materiality and you know other concepts of, of what could be material. But at the same time, we've always explicitly recognized that companies have to decide for themselves what's material when they're applying our standards in their disclosures. And that may well be influenced by the regulatory climate that they operate in. So I would kind of my reaction to these comments about you don't need a definition of materiality is that while they're certainly phrased as something structural, maybe we need to address them through more clarity and you know emphasizing the fact that we can't dictate to companies what's material for them but we have to have a, a filter a yardstick a strainer whatever you want to call it to determine what's what we're going to put in our standards and what we aren't yep mark 
Yeah, my comment was actually very similar to uh, to, to to Dan's, but I I must say that that concept, which I also I think saw back in the, the comment letters from Calpers and ICGN, in kind of this this hierarchy of we determining what is financially material in the sta from a standard statistics perspective, and then the company still uh, deciding whether they comply or not, uh, depending on how material it is for them, is not a notion that I had picked up uh, clearly from you know reading the conceptual framework and. So maybe it is something that uh, that that needs some further clarification, um, yeah. for, for sure. Just right? On, yeah, we'll just, we'll just on that, like we we do say that we um, try to identify topics that are reasonably likely to be financially material in a given industry. Um, and so you know that that is trying to to acknowledge that it's industry like that it's situation specific, but that given the nature of business, there are going to be topics that are more likely. Um, the sort of thing that investor would want to know about, you know, that you know, it might be expected that this is the sort of thing that a company might be doing. And even if you you aren't engaged in this sort of activity, in my view, sometimes that's still decision useful for an investor to be able to say, oh, well, this is one this is one company that stands out in an industry is not facing those types of issues. So I actually think, you know, decision useful uh, information relates sometimes to to something that's not necessarily material from a company operations perspective because it's sort of suggesting that they are not engaged in an activity that other um, firms might reasonably be uh, peer companies might reasonably be engaged in. Yeah, I had two more points, if I may, and sorry, I, and then I'll I'll, I'll 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 step down a bit because I'm speaking a lot today. But uh, uh, the other point that I picked up on from reading the comment letters was, I think, a request for uh, explaining more of the double materiality concept, even though, uh, you know, we're not on the other side of the materiality. But I thought, you know, especially if you look at the, the climate uh, related uh, disclosure paper that the five, uh, including us, de uh, developed, there's a, an excellent uh, uh, explanation of, I think, how at least the dynamic materiality works. and. I didn't see it here, but Shivani for sure. I think that's something that that we probably need to take into account. You know, whether whether there, there is uh, something uh, to to be said there, because um, that, that was especially yeah. true. If um, uh, you know, to the extent that 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 we settle on concepts in a way to articulate them, then uh, then it's you know lo likely to have a longer shelf life in a sense. And uh, you know, this conversation has moved so quickly that. Uh, I do kind of wonder if there's going to be a better, you know, phrase for the for a similar concept, you know, in in three to six months. And I don't like if so, like I we want to be a little bit careful around, um, you know, things that aren't inside of our scope, so we don't define them, but that people talk about them. But I totally take the point that uh, it can be very helpful for scoping um, what we do by comparing it to what um, what we don't do. I think at least what I've heard, uh, uh, Jeff, is there is also in Europe quite, quite sometimes a, a misunderstanding of exactly what it is that we cover, which is more than people give us credit for. And, uh, and, and I think that's why I think it is important to kind of have that whole spectrum. And uh, I, I at least found this very useful. Uh, and, and the last point I was going to, uh, to make or, or ask, I, I thought there was uh, I, in similar vein as Mark, I think the head starts spinning when you see all the different opinions. And probably it, it 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 needs some you know some further paper that that develops the pros and cons of of the different approaches that are being uh, that are being suggested because I don't think there was a kind of a um, you know a one one prevailing view on uh, on, on on that reality. So maybe uh, that's something that we will see. I don't know how the process works, but that we may see back at the board at some point. Absolutely, we certainly have a lot more to, to do in terms of synthesizing, digesting, distilling the, the, the feedback that we've gotten. Um, yeah. Brian, just to give you, a, were you going to jump in on something that Mark said? Yeah, I, I, well, I was going to ask kind of a dumb question of how far apart is our definition from uh, IASBs? Is that a big leap or what's the essence of the difference? Uh, no, I think the, the definition for materiality is not, um, it's not, that different from what the IASB uses. Um, I do think that, and this goes back to the, the conversation with Mark Siegel, that uh, you know they have one paragraph or so on financial or on materiality. They don't use the term financial, but they have one paragraph of materiality in their relevance section. But relevance is the primary characteristic that they're really focused on, and so that I think. You know, I actually take that as being like the bigger disconnect to aligning with the ISB, which also I think is, um, you know, kind of the bigger point than this and what's on the slide right here. So, great, thanks. 
And, and Kurt, that was explicitly acknowledged in a number of the responses as well, in, in terms of how we drew heavily from um, the the um, IASB de definition. But with that said, um, I think um, you know, short of diving into it here in this discussion, I think one of the topics for the board to really keep thinking about is on is uh, around how our definition of financial materiality is very much based on the concept of enterprise value, and I think that's maybe even what you were starting to get at. Uh, a little bit earlier, Jeff, in that um, that can that can potentially create some more options in terms of how we could think about approaching this and structuring this in the conceptual framework um, by acknowledging that like really like what we're getting at here, what we really want to understand is enterprise value creation and and destruction. And we think of financial materiality as a concept as a useful concept for the staff and the board to think about in this what you referred to as. As, as filtering, but really underneath that, or kind of a step further than that is enterprise value creation. So I know no immediate solutions there. I just think that that's gonna be part of, uh, probably part of the solution and how we can keep uh, continuing the conceptual framework uh, forward to make sure that we're, we're clear. Awesome. Thank you all. Thanks, Should I, how are we doing on time? Should I go into characteristics or would you prefer if I jump to next steps? Jeff. Um, Brian, do you have a view? I think we can take a couple minutes on um, characteristics and that I don't think we should spend more than five to 10 more, uh, minutes before shifting over to the uh, infrastructure agenda item. Perfect. Sounds good. There we go. All right, characteristics. So again, received a range of feedback for characteristics. Unsurprisingly, we received a lot of feedback on individual characteristics um, that respondents felt should be revised or removed, or in the case of distributed, reintroduced. Um, but most of the feedback that we received can be bucketed into the following three categories. So the first category asked that SASB provide transparency into the hierarchy of characteristics. The second category asks that we remove all topic characteristics because they may be redundant given our fundamental tenets. And the third category asks SASB's characteristics to further align with those of the IASB. So Jeff, anything to add here? And again, I'll give everyone a moment to read through these and ask any questions. Yeah, so, you know, I think this is, um... You know, we've got a lot to digest here, so I don't think we're going to have any like really obvious takeaways. But, um, you know, I do think of this as being um, through two lenses. One is the the lens of like how it helps us to communicate what we do, but then also um, going back and relying uh, on feedback that we've gotten from the, the staff over time in terms of like how this actually helps the staff to execute on what we ask, uh, you know, we, what we ask of you. And, and so, uh, uh, I think it, it should be informed by all of that, and uh, and the nature of what we do is again like it is it is a bit different than what we see in financial accounting. So it's really going to be uh, I think trying to balance both of those perspectives, making sure that we can connect with all of our audiences, but also have the type of guidance that we need to execute on our work. Um, there is a, a hierarchical nature to to this conceptual framework, and so. It's true we could emphasize more the things at the very top and just sort of leave it, um, you know, without without going on and on at, at finer levels. But to the extent that helps people understand what we do or it helps the you know the staff to execute on on the process, then um, I actually think it's it's really important that we don't lose that uh, clarity. Um, we should think about what aspects of that 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 do make sense. And sometimes um, you know we need certain concepts somewhere and i think it's just a question of where is most appropriate you know are we talking about characteristics of information are we talking about you know something that relates more to the process uh, are we talking about you know something that relates more to the outcome and uh, and i think as long as we think carefully about those those broad types of buckets and questions uh, we'll be able to like uh, digest this information and see where there are essentially like opportunities to improve further the the document uh, as as we've you know, over, over and above what we've already done to sort of move it forward. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, definitely a lot to think about. All right. Um, so as far as next steps are concerned, 
So the SASB staff and standards board members have several moving parts. So we, as we mentioned earlier, want to continue the analysis of all comments. We want to follow up with respondents if we have any clarifying questions regarding their comment letters. We want to engage foundation board members in the discussion of topics related to the mission or to scope changes. We want to reconnect as a project team to establish an effective project plan moving forward. We also want to establish a list of open questions, including questions like how SASB's objectives have changed since these projects first began. And we want to facilitate discussions to answer those questions. Over the course of the past year or so, so much has changed in the sustainability disclosure landscape. And there have been some organizational changes with SASB's merger with the IARC. So we feel that taking a step back and discussing some of these larger topics while also considering each and every comment that we received will ensure that we have an appropriate and effective project plan moving forward. Elizabeth, question or comment on next steps? Yeah. I, you know, I, I people, a number of people said that reading the comments just sort of made their heads spin, and I, I felt the same way. But first, let me just say, appreciate all the comments. It was really amazing to see the amount of feedback that we got. So good job in getting that feedback, and, and thanks for everybody who did that. But, you know, I, I think what we see is a reflection of materiality in the ESG world broadly, right? Like the whole... Um, community is really struggling around this concept of materiality and to Jeff's point, and this is something I talk about all the time, people using the same terms to mean something different and different terms to mean the same thing. And it, it's like, you know, coming up with a, a true North Star in, in that context is just always going to be challenging. And so I think it's explicitly built in here in terms of your near term activities, but I think engagement um, an understanding of all of the other organizations that are focused on this right now obviously needs to be a part of it. You've already mentioned some of them, but I think it, you know, making sure we are understanding how we're the same or different from all of these other um, definitions will be really important so that when we, we finalize our definition, and I have strong feelings on that, um, we we can react to how it's different from others and why why we chose that pathway. I think that'll be an important piece of the analysis. Thanks, yeah, thanks Elizabeth. Yeah, to to totally agree. Really, really good points there. And um, actually, uh, you know, the, we do have, uh, and a part of it is going to be in the project plan to to re-engage uh, on some of what we've heard back to make sure that like we understood it correctly and uh, and whether there's a way that we could find a middle ground that that would actually be viewed as being helpful. But you know, it just reminds me, and this goes back to a little bit like the project, uh, uh, like the path to get to where we are. I mean, one reason that I think we got. The, the high quality letters that we did get was in part, you know, I want to give credit to Shivani and, and Brian and, and the team for, for setting up, uh, you know, webinars, consultations, you know, like spending time on the phone, walking organizations through what we do, why we do it and, and helping them to understand it so that they could then, you know, digest that and give us feedback on what they think of that. And so, um, you know, it's, uh, it's been a, it's been a process and it's going to remain a big process to, to continue on with, but um, you know, definitely um, big props to, to, to Shivani and the team for getting us at least to this point so far. Any other thoughts on next steps? If not, um, I just want to thank you all for your time today. Thanks for a great discussion standards board. Um, for those in the audience, please feel free to visit the conceptual framework and rules of procedure project pages for more information on the projects. Also, please feel free to reach out to me. My email is on this slide. And thank you all again. Thanks, Shivani. Um, you know, as anticipated, we have a, a lot to, to continue to digest in this respect, and a lot of work to do, but uh, look forward to the progress that, uh, that we're going to be making in that respect. And, and thanks for your efforts that, and, on, on this. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, um, we're now up to uh, the, the second discussion item for the second session of the day. Um, so if we've got uh, Will with us, we can go ahead and move to the, the next slide. Um, and looks like hey, Jeff. there we go. Hey, Will, how are you? Doing all right. Thanks. How are you? Great. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, well, thanks for the opportunity to address the board. Looking forward to this. 
Uh, so really just wanted to kick off and say today's session, we'd like to provide an overview of staff's research that was included in the staff memo to the board on three early stage research opportunities in the infrastructure sector. The staff believes are potential priority issues based on preliminary research and consultation. And really to understand the board's interest in and questions on these opportunities as staff considers future project development. Now staff is not asking the board today to make a project decision, nor are we looking to the board to make a prioritization decision. I'm really just trying to understand at this stage what the board's thoughts are on these opportunities, any concerns that the board may have, and how staff should really focus on research going forward and the opportunities uh, that the board may be interested in pursuing. Uh, so next, just want to quickly highlight uh, some of the opportunities we'll be discussing. And so the first opportunities, uh, two opportunities that you see here relate to considerations around internationalization of the standards. While the third opportunity uh, relates to an emerging issue that staff has been monitoring over the past few years. Now, these opportunities are first on renewable energy policies and electric utilities. Second, on the incorporation of end use efficiency into business models of electric gas and water utilities. And third, on healthy buildings and real estate. We'll then quickly recap and we can go over next steps. Now staff would like to address each opportunity individually. Staff will provide a brief background on the opportunity and then would like to leave the majority of time that we have for board discussion. So why are we discussing some of these issues today? And really the reasons behind that, uh, staff has received and collected market feedback, reviewed related literature and publications, and analyzed SASB disclosures to understand these opportunities, all of which indicate that there may be some concerns that could be potentially addressed. Now, before we begin with the individual opportunities, I just wanted to ask if there are any questions on our objectives or the structure of this session. Okay, hearing none, let's go ahead and let's begin with our first opportunity on renewable energy policies in electric utilities. So in the electric utility standard, the greenhouse gas emissions and energy resource planning topic states that companies in this industry can reduce greenhouse gas emissions from electricity generation, mainly through careful planning of their infrastructure investments to ensure an energy mix capable of meeting the emissions requirements set forth by regulations and by implementing industry leading technologies and processes. Now within this disclosure topic, the accounting metric that you see here measures a company's regulatory risk as it relates to fulfillment of renewable portfolio standards. And real quickly here, a renewable portfolio standard is a policy mechanism to increase energy production from renewable sources. Now staff has received feedback from several companies and industry groups in countries in Asia and Europe without renewable portfolio standards that this specific metric does not apply and indicated that this metric may lack an international focus. Staff would like to note that other industries outside uh, infrastructure also include references to renewable portfolio standards, and there may be opportunities to consider globally applicable terminology as well. Now, this disclosure topic may therefore not complete a complete set of metrics. The different renewable energy policies have been implemented globally, such as feed-in tariffs. And according to one source, 143 countries have some form of renewable energy policy in place but not all have implemented renewable portfolio standards. Uh, additionally, there's also a high emission rate in SASB disclosures by non-US companies on this metric on renewable portfolio standards. So we're thinking about this feedback and, and the research that we've done, you know, what are some of the things that we could consider here? And so staff is considering investigating different renewable energy policy mechanisms to determine how to improve the completeness of the metric in this disclosure topic. Staff would really like to better understand how this information is being used in decision making by users. Now, staff sees advantages to doing this by improving the global applicability of the standard, by addressing the high prevalence of renewable energy policies globally, and by narrowing the focus to renewable energy policies compared to broader themes within the disclosure topic or the industry standard itself, it may be possible to accomplish the project with a faster timeline and to address market feedback. Now on the flip side, of course, thinking about some drawbacks that this may entail, staff would like to point out that there may be four more fundamental issues with the industry standard related to underlying sustainability issues that could be overlooked by focusing solely on renewable energy policies. Now there may be broader business resiliency issues connected to renewable energy and business strategy 
that would be outside this potential scope. Further, the structure of the industry as scoped in the standard may be a point of consideration as it relates to the type of regulatory environment in which a utility operates, essentially thinking about here differences in regulated and deregulated markets. Additionally, you know, this may impact capacity depending on the avenue taken to address this, it may require periodic reassessments as renewable energy policies evolve and change globally, leading to a potential ongoing need of staff and board's time. Now, having gone over this opportunity, staff would like to now pose a few questions uh, to the board. And really, staff is seeking the board's input on their views on the research collected to date as explained in the staff memo to the board, any concerns that the board may have in pursuing this early stage research opportunity, especially considering the potential scope, as well as how staff should focus a research and consultation going forward for a potential possible uh, project on this. So I'd like to turn it over to any questions or comments the board may have here. Thanks, Willow. I'll, I'll kick off. Um, so I, I'm supportive of, of this project. I, I liked your presentation. I like the focus on the global um, applicability improvement and um, focus on a climate metric, which is uh, very much in demand and, and supportive of interest. And I could really see how this could enable companies to better um, meet their goals for TCFD aligned reporting with, with providing more applicable and useful metrics for global companies. Um, you, you pointed out the number one concern here, which is the ability for the metric to be sufficiently inclusive of something that's continuously evolving and not just in one jurisdiction, but in multiple jurisdictions and potentially across federations or constituent states or provinces. Um, so my question for you, Will, is do we have an example from another industry where we've created a metric or designed a group of metrics that has that flexibility built in? I personally don't love the idea of um, periodic projects consist, you know, constantly coming back to the board to be updated when, you know, China gets a new policy or Denmark gets a new policy that's different from the EU. I'm making things up here. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Verity. No, I, I think that's, uh, you know, a very valid question that, you know, we definitely need to consider in pursuing this if we decide to do that. And looking at the, the solar technology industry, there we have a descriptive uh, metric that essentially asks about risk and opportunities related to energy policy. And so that, you know, leaves sort of this broad uh, uh, opportunity to, to uh, report on how, you know, any number of different policies may be creating, you know, these opportunities or risk to, to a solar technology uh, developer. Um, so that could be, you know, maybe a model that we might want to consider and thinking about, you know, moving forward with this. Um, you know, I think we'd have to balance that with trying to understand the decision usefulness of that and really, you know, ensuring that we're including elements there that, you know, may be important enough. Maybe there are quantita quantitative measures that are important to include in this. So I think that would be something uh, really interesting to, to think about and pursue. Brian, were you going to jump in on that? I'll just maybe very briefly share one other example, thinking about the hazardous waste topic that we have in a number of industries, including a specific metric on hazardous waste. Uh, we have the concept there of, of hazardous waste or in the metric specifically hazardous waste generated. Um, and sometimes it gets into amounts recycled as, as well. Uh, we, we did engage a lot with the, with the board in the past around um, uh, revising, really shifting that definition of the term up a level to be flexible based on the jurisdiction that the company operates in and we got comfortable with that now that's a little bit of a different situation here because it was about jurisdictional flexibility in defining a specific term here i think what we might be thinking about is something more along the lines of what what's the kind of higher level principle that sits above renewable portfolio standards that could then capture a range of policy mechanisms so it's a little bit more challenging but maybe and Will, if you have any further thoughts on this, maybe there's an opportunity to establish, you know, clear principle around these the kind of range of policy mechanisms that are used in the world that can still lead to that kind of comparable, useful uh, data, um, which which is one of the concerns we just want to have in mind when we're elevating a level to more more of a of a, of a principle. Yeah, thanks, Brian. I think fully, you know, I think we need to peel back the layers of the onion a bit on these different policy mechanisms, understand the landscape, what's going on, 
uh, you know, it's continually evolving. Policies are phased in, phased out, and so really trying to understand, as you were saying, you know, the principles of these and what what they aim to achieve, and, and looking for those commonalities across those. Well, this is Bob. I might uh, chime in here. So, first of all, in terms of interest, I think this is a good topic to pursue in the view that, you know, the technology within this sector and industry is changing rather rapidly, and and therefore, as those change, certain things become more important, so I think we should continue to to look at this. So it's a good topic. I think number two, Brian's comment is good on, you know, are there some stand back base metrics, regardless of wherever you are, that can be universally applicable? But I also think um, when you talk about regulation and policy mechanisms and our goal to try to, you know, be all things to all people in every country of the world, um, I think a convention we've used in a couple of the other industries is using uh, the term regional equivalence. So I know we started out with some U.S. wording and some U.S. regulations and some industries, and we said, well, you could use that U.S. metric or you could use a regional equivalence. So I think as we look at that, <clears throat> what that lets everybody do is properly report what they're supposed to or what they have to report given their jurisdiction. And then thirdly, in terms of activities, I think we can undertake Obviously, the the typical investor and issuer input, we want to continue to seek that, and the the, uh, the calls that you've had and other analysts have had are really good. But also, this is an industry where there are, I think, some powerful and well-organized industry associations uh, in the U.S. and beyond in other countries. So I think as you begin to look at your you're formulating your plan as to go how to who to reach out to, that we look at some of those large industry associations as well. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Bob. I wholeheartedly agree with that and definitely appreciate that. Yeah, Mark, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I had a question for my own understanding, and I, uh, I, yeah, I, I apologize you know, prompt for asking sometimes maybe simple questions that I ought to know, uh, but I'm new, so I, I, I hope uh, I'm granted. Um, how does this practice? Uh, so I think it's a. Uh, uh, a project that really tries to internationalize, I think, what you've got in the standard at the moment, as I understand it, right? Uh, how does this project then relate to the internationalization project, was my question. Um, does that mean that the internationalization project uh, is, is broken down in, in smaller ones like this? Or that was, I think, the overall question that I had. Or, or is the internationalization project one project? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, I'll take a quick stab at it and then Brian or Jeff, if you wanna jump in there and provide any additional detail. But this is a, you know, a, a subset. It's been something that has been identified uh, as an output of that project as an area to consider in addition uh, to the, the feedback that we've heard uh, from uh, disclosures. Uh, so it's um, you know, coming out of, of that larger uh, undertaking there as in addition to the feedback. But One way to think about it is that internationalization project, Mark, is really an earlier stage project that did a very comprehensive assessment across the entire range of the standards. Now this, what Will is presenting and speaking on here, was one of the many opportunities identified in yeah. that project. And so this is uh, our considerations around carrying, uh, carrying it forward, uh, potentially in the direction more of a kind of formal standard setting capacity. Right. No, very, very supportive of, uh, I mean, certainly internationalizing, but it, it helps in my understanding. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Right, thanks. Yeah. Well, I think we can go on to the to maybe the next opportunity. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jeff. Just to quickly recap here, um, just continually staff under, here's from the board that uh, generally supportive of, of pursuing this idea further. Uh, we'll consider uh, other industries uh, in terms of how they may potentially have addressed something similar. Um, of course, considering regional equivalency, principles-based approach, and thinking about that, how we move forward, and continuing to, to engage with the market, uh, in particular industry organizations as well. So thank you for the input on that one. So we can move on to our next topic here on the incorporation of end-use efficiency into business models of utilities. And so now within electric gas and water utilities, they can partake in a wide range of activities to promote energy or water efficiency and conservation among their customers, such as offering rebates for energy efficient appliances, 
or offering incentives to customers to curb electricity use during times of peak demand. Now within the end use efficiency disclosure topic, the accounting metrics that you see here measure the extent to which an entity is subject to decoupling policies. Now decoupling is a form of alternative rate design that essentially decouples utility revenues from cons uh, customer consumer consumption and may also build in explicit incentives for end use efficiency. Now, similarly here, staff has received feedback uh, from several companies and industry groups, largely within electric utilities, uh, countries in Asia and Europe, without these decoupling policies, that this specific metric does not apply and indicated that this uh, metric may have a stronger US focus. Now, this disclosure topic, uh, therefore, may not contain a complete set of metrics. Besides the coupling, there are other approaches to incorporate end use efficiency into utilities business models. Uh, similarly here as well, we've seen a high emission rate in SASB disclosures by non-US companies on this metric. And so thinking about this, what is one way that we may want to consider moving forward on this uh, topic? And the potential idea here, uh, staff is considering investigating different approaches implemented globally to incorporate this end use efficiency into business models of utilities, really to determine you know, how to improve the completeness of the metrics that we have in this disclosure topic. And so the advantages similarly here to the first opportunity staff sees uh, are related to global applicability, uh, addressing the high, likely high prevalence of these different approaches globally. And similarly here, narrowing the focus to simply to these approaches uh, may help to speed up, allow for a faster accomplishment of this project and address market feedback. Uh, similarly here as well, thinking about this, staff would like to point out that there may be more fundamental issues with the industry standard that could be overlooked by simply focusing more uh, narrowly on these types of approaches uh, and that the regulatory complexity really here could suggest that other scoping options uh, may be more adequately addressing some of the, the underlying issues that we're seeing here with this. Again, thinking about regulated and deregulated utilities. Also acknowledging here the complexity and variation uh, and approach that could exist uh, to the incorporation of these end use efficiency uh, approaches uh, is, a, is a broader and taking in and of itself despite the intended narrow scope of this. And so this could also impact the timeliness of a pros, uh, proposed solution and staff's capacity as well. And so having gone over this opportunity, we'd like to, to pose uh, the same set of questions to the board to see uh, what their input is in terms of uh, the research collected to date, uh, any concerns, and uh, focus going forward on this. Lloyd, I see. Yeah, well, <clears throat> maybe um, if you could maybe clarify a little further, it seems from a financial or an investment perspective, you really want to know where a company stands with respect to energy efficiency, almost regardless of how they generate the efficiency. So one utility might decide to build a bunch of solar plant. Another company might decide to outsource um, the solar plant. So if if the choice is narrow scope or broad scope, it just seems to me the instinct should be to go broader scope so that you can so the investors can see the whole picture and that economies or I'm sorry utilities probably should be thinking about it that way that they should be not worried quite so much about how do we look on this one metric but what does our overall business mix look like so I guess that's where my sentiment is anyway. Thanks, Lloyd. Yeah, that was helpful. Definitely. Um you know, issues that we can continue to think about and debate as we move forward and collect more research on this. I, I might just add in really quick, Lloyd, uh, a lot of our consultations in the past with um, companies within the industry, um, including some of the, the, the um, uh, major industry associations, EEI, for example, um, that uh, Bob, Bob referenced earlier, um, have been about kind of the competing kind of trade-offs among sustainability issues within the uh, uh the industry especially when you include issues like affordability which is a topic within the industry so when we think as directly as possible about this topic that will is bringing forward this end use efficiency topic around how regulated utilities are just working with regulators to design their rate structures um to you know improve resilience improve um you know uh, cost of capital and so forth um um, in the face of, of increasing en energy efficiency, it's really completely impossible to not think about that in, in the context of also the GHG emissions disclosure topic. And I think that's part of 
what you're what you're getting at here, just how interrelated these sustainability issues are. Um, I think that can, um, you know, that doesn't necessarily have to prevent us from focusing on like a single metric for uh, improving, you know, uh, international applicability, for example. But your point is a really good one that everything within this industry is very, very interrelated. Yeah. Well, and nobody right. loses if yeah. you can, in an economic way, make your utility more efficient. Customers can get lower prices. It's probably environmentally better and investors like efficient utilities better than inefficient ones so in the end i think all the incentives point in the same direction but it would be a mistake to myopically focus on just one spoke of that wheel yeah this one this one to me is a little more troublesome uh, i think the first one where we're talking about you know the mix of capacity and the resilience and those things, you know, that's really how do you produce and what's your exposure or benefit of your mix of the energy. This one really is getting into your pricing mechanism. And so it's at the other end of the funnel. And are you building pricing practices that encourage conservation or off peak use and those things? And my worry here is, you know, there may be different measures you know, RPSs or whatever on the supply side, but at least you've got kind of a, a single structure of what, what is the sourcing and mix of your power. This one, it seems like would be even more diverse and more impacted by company practices and policies. And so, well, this one worries me a little more about its ability to be relevant globally. I mean, this this is a fascinating topic and different, I know at least within the US, certainly different Energy companies have a very strong focus, a very high variable rate to discourage use. But then is that, you know, is that counterproductive for lower income families? And there's a lot of dynamics. I just I am worried about how applicable this can be to be meaningful information. So any perspective, Will, on the relative ability to globalize this or is it just going to be a narrative rather than a metric? So. Yeah, thanks, Kurt. You know, I think that's definitely one of the areas that we'd like to further pursue and try to, to understand better generally is just the decision usefulness of this and, and understanding how it's being used in its current state and form. In addition, as you were saying, you know, rate making in and of itself, there, there are different ways to approach that different uh, within each jurisdiction, their own approaches to that. And so, you know, there is a lot to delve into just within that one topic. And then thinking about this even broader, of course, that that is just kind of one slice of the pie and that there are any number, as you were saying, company practices, policies that may be in place to to promote this end use efficiency among customers. Uh, and so, you know, that is the the even within kind of this this narrower scope of it, there is a lot to potentially look into to dive into. Um, and really trying to understand, you know, what it is, which of those are providing that that decision useful information to do it. Um, so, you know, I definitely think that this is an area for staff to to consider going forward and and continue to research and try to understand, um, you know, some of the more dynamics of that and which of these uh, different types of of mechanisms or uh, approaches may be really driving that decision making. Yeah, I mean, another piece of the puzzle is how you know how are customers that are partially off the grid treated from a pricing perspective. I know there's current debates these days about whether, uh, you know, people that generate their own power are getting a free ride or are they actually, as, as Lloyd had mentioned, you know, using their capital to help help out the power companies. So it's a very tangled area and, and it seems, and I guess I'd be more interested in kind of a landscape description than going for a solution right now. Because this one, I think, could be highly different country by country and even state by state. So it would. This one seems like just better understanding how deep a water this is would be useful. And it's certainly a moving picture. You know, Texas, the big debate about did the solar people help us or hurt us, blah blah blah. And that really gets into the same thing of end use behavior and whether that uh, you know is insightful for company value. Thanks, Kurt. Yeah, yeah, definitely a lot more to consider here and, and a lot more consultation and research to, to do to, to help us really get a, a better grasp and handle on what it is, you know, that we we may need to, to pursue with this. So appreciate that. Thanks, Kurt.
Are there any other questions or comments that I can address on this one? Okay, well, maybe just to quickly recap, uh, definitely an understanding here of thinking about the, the broader scope of this and the decision usefulness that that may provide to, to investors. Um, you know, thinking much more here about, as, as Kurt was mentioning, just understanding the landscape a bit better, continuing to, to do that. Uh, staff will continue to, to pursue uh, the understanding there and try to provide uh, that analysis to the board at a later stage. So why don't we go ahead and move into our third and final topic today, which is on healthy buildings in the real estate industry. And this is an emerging issue that we've uh, seen here on the topic of healthy buildings. And a healthy building, just to quickly define here, uh, as defined by the World Health Organization, is a space that supports the physical, psychological, and social health and well being of people. Now, the design and maintenance of buildings can impact tenant health and productivity in a variety of ways, such as through indoor air quality, thermal comfort, and lighting. Now, tenants may design and construct lease spaces according to their operating needs, meaning that their operations can impact the health of those living, working, shopping, or visiting the properties. Now, while the sustainability impacts are often generated by tenant operations and activities, real estate owners have an important role in influencing some of these tenant sustainability impacts. And we've seen there's a growing body of evidence that suggests that this emerging issue may be of greater significance than is currently represented in the real estate standard. And staff has been monitoring this issue over the past few years, and it was discussed in the industry research brief published in 2016. Now, staff has received market feedback from a few companies and investor subject matter experts in North America that healthy buildings are an area of this growing significance, as well as additional research that seems to support this. And feedback provided has referenced the ongoing global pandemic and its impact on the industry, in particular around considerations related to building ventilation, which is part of SASB's ongoing monitoring of the impacts connected to COVID-19. Now, this suggests that there may be more to consider than is currently covered in the industry standard with regards to the qualitative disclosure reference in the metric you see here, which includes in the scope of the discussion on a company's approach to measuring, incentivizing, and improving sustainability impacts of tenants related to the impacts of properties on tenant health, including indoor environmental quality. And so considering this feedback and, and the growing significance of this issue, what are areas where staff can continue to pursue to research. And so staff believes that there may be value to conduct research more publicly on these following issues. Uh, first one here being to understand sustainability impact, continually seeking to better understand the sustainability impacts associated with healthy buildings, such as the impacts related to indoor air quality, thermal comfort and lighting. Uh, two, to really understand the drivers of financial impact here. We'll continue to seek to improve understanding and gather evidence on the financial impacts of these healthy buildings on the real estate industry. Uh, here, looking at the financial impacts uh, on, but not really limited to necessarily to rent prices, asset value, and return on investment. And third, understanding user interest. Continue to understand the data that's being used and desired by users to inform decision making. And lastly, understanding the relevant industry certifications and regulations. So continue to build our understanding of these various schemes and regulations in the industry. And so very similarly here, staff would like to, to ask the same set of questions to the board in terms of their views on the research included in staff's memo, uh, concerns, if, uh, concerns if any of the board may have, and uh, uh, focus going forward on consultations and research. We're just going to go, we can go in order. Um, I'll right, start. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, I'm, I'm definitely intrigued by the issue. I was, I was, uh, I was very interested as, as, as I was reading the materials and I've certainly seen organizations pop up. I think you, you um, hit the nail on the head with some of the areas to, uh, to continue to research. Obviously the user interest is going to be important. Um, obviously, um, you know how the the financial significance is going to be important too. One area that popped up in the memo um, was was sort of how is this being measured and, and managed by by property owners today, and the data reliability around that um, would be something that I I didn't see explicitly in there, but I'm sure it's it's implied uh, somewhere. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, you know. 
definitely due to the growing significance of this, you know, there is more and more data being collected that we're understanding uh, by real estate owners. Uh, there may be some considerations too, depending on the size of an organization. So maybe that the larger organizations may be in a better position to, to collect some of the data that may help inform decision-making here. Uh, so that will definitely be a consideration that we would you know, wanna have going forward. Uh, you know, some of the information shared uh, related to, to really the development of this, you know, uh, in terms of understanding eco-efficiency uh, a number of years back is that this is, you know, evolving to a point where uh, it's becoming uh, an area where more and more uh, owners are, are collecting that type of data similarly, but uh, still uh, an area of, of you know, growing understanding from that respect. Okay, look forward to learning more. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Um, well, I think that uh, I might be saying the same thing Mark is saying, but I think as you do your research, my, my view is some of this um, healthy building activity is already being reported by a number of companies for their own marketing purposes or whatever. So I think it'd be interesting to look at um, what is the state of the reporting. And then many times that may be outside of CSR reporting. Sometimes it's it's in there. And then begin to look at what seem to be the major um, certifiers or people that they um, you know allude to as certifying their buildings, et cetera. So just looking at what you because the metric right now is um, it's a very good quantitative base, you know, request you know, tell us about such and such. And mm -hmm. if we begin to look at that, I know we've not been in the, in the position to necessarily recommend any particular, um, you know, organizations as it relates to certification. But I, I just be interested as you do your research is what is the state of play already in terms of disclosure about this healthy building topic? Yeah, thanks, Bob. That's something that staff uh, acknowledges and, and will do going forward here on this. Definitely interesting to understand what the current market state of that is. Thanks, Will. Uh, my question has to do with whether this is actually the right industry um, in that how much of the healthy building um, activity is in the control of the real estate owner versus the tenant. I think you alluded to this in your memo a little bit, but I could see this potentially having similar issues as in the food and agriculture industry where we found that some of the activities that we were trying to measure were actually, you know, a different part of the supply chain. So is this actually a downstream issue or um, is this a material impact that the real estate owners can actually control? Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. I, you know, it's a great, uh, great question and, and definitely something, you know, that we've heard some feedback on, but I think it's definitely something that we should continue to to consider and and really, you know, who has that, that control over it, as you were saying. Um, you know, the, from understanding with some very initial conversations around this, that there are some elements of that, you know, when you think about uh, building design uh, with ventilation, for example, and, and how owners can influence that, um, you know, definitely uh, an area of consideration there. Um, but you're right, you know, really trying to understand that that management of the issue from the owner versus tenant perspective, uh, wholeheartedly agree, definitely important that we, we keep that in mind as we go forward with this research. Great, thanks. Thanks, Stephanie. Yeah, and, and just a brief comment from me. This is not an area of uh, expertise for me, but I have recently been made aware of uh, a benchmarking tool that exists uh, in Europe uh, that's called Gresby. Uh, so you might have come across that. Otherwise, I will I will send it to you, Will. Um, so this is one where, where private equity uh, property owners definitely are competing uh, amongst themselves to uh, to, to match uh, that benchmarking and that one does not include, and that's my point, does not include uh, the health uh, dimension. It's only from an you know environmental uh, energy sanity check. Um, so so certainly one that uh, where it could be you know latched onto um, if anything. But uh, that could be an interesting one. I think it it, it is an investor led, and I think it came out of uh, Luxembourg originally, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, thanks, Suzanne. Uh, Brian, would you like to maybe speak to the historical interaction with Gres? Yeah, sure. Suzanne, I'm, I'm glad you you brought uh, uh, Gresby up, and I think we can even tie them back to the earlier questions from. Mark and Bob and Stephanie are very, very familiar with, with the, the organization and we've had the uh, ability 
uh, to uh, engage with them for a number of years here, and they've really been constructive for helping our thinking around the development of the, the uh, real estate industry standard. Coming back to this issue specifically, uh, a little bit of historical context here is that they they actually created a pilot, what they called, I believe, a pilot module that supplemented their kind of core assessment that was primarily around energy and water. Uh, the pilot module was specifically around health and well-being. I think if I'm not mistaken, they did that starting back in 2016 and two, or 2017. I'm not sure exactly where it stands today, but I do know that they have significantly grown the number of real estate owners who've started to respond to that module. Um, and I, you know, like you said yourself, Suzanne, that is designed for investors, produce assessments and ratings that are designed to be useful for investors. So that really gives us a lot of, you know, running start for data and insights into the level and nature of in investor interest. Um, so I think that does kind of start to tie back to some of the questions that Mark and Bob um, and even Stephanie raised um, just around how this is a this is a quickly quickly developing, quickly maturing issue within the industry. It's come a long way just from my own observations in the last five or six years uh, back since we developed the provisional standard. Maybe one other data point, I think something that Bob raised around certifications is there are a couple of um, increasingly large, sometimes even international uh, certification bodies in this area. The Well Building Institute is, is a good example. FitWell is another example. I think there's a more recently recent standard called Reset. Um, all these are, are standards designed for, for buildings to help measure, you know, and standardize or certify um, health and well-being type impacts. Um, so I'm glad you, I'm really glad you raised that, uh, Gresby, um, uh, Suzanne, um, uh, influential um, kind of ratings and assessments um, uh, organization uh, designed for investors within the industry. Great. Any other questions or comments on this one? Okay. Well, just to quickly uh, recap here, uh, definitely uh, as staff moves forward with this and thinking about this, uh, keeping uh, data reliability or data accessibility uh, availability in mind as we move forward, uh, cons considerations around that, uh, really uh, developing in a, a broader understanding of, of the landscape, the current reporting landscape, uh, the, uh, the players and actors uh, in this area as well. Uh, and then uh, balancing that out and thinking and maintaining and understanding uh, the control element of that in terms of the, the owner versus tenant relationship uh, and uh, additionally just continuing to, to monitor the development of this as we go forward. Oh, Kurt, I see you're here. Yeah, well, just, I guess, final two cents here. Uh, clearly, this is an evolving space and looking at the history of leads and those other building measures is insightful. My only concern on this, are we shooting a little ahead of the runner? Um, it's evolving rapidly, but is it is it solidified enough? And is this one where we try to create a standard only to find that, you know, approach A versus approach B? So I'm just not positive that this is quite fully baked yet. And, uh, you know, we just, I'd, I'd have a little caution on are we shooting at a moving target or a, a you know a dish that's still being cooked rather than really trying to lock and load on the standard? So just a warning. Yeah, no, thanks, Kurt. And that's actually a great segue into uh, the final question that I'd like to pose to the board with the last few minutes that we have here uh, is really, you know, without uh, asking for a prioritization decision, but as Kurt, as you just mentioned, you know, really trying to understand if there are there any views here on the prioritization of this set of opportunities and and Kurt, hearing your comments here about, you know, making sure that we understand the landscape, uh, considering that going forward, um, just want to hear from the board if there are any other thoughts related similar to what, to what Kurt mentioned here with that. Jeff. Hey, Will. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think this is, this is, um, it's, it's really interesting stuff. Uh, it seems like, the, you know, uh, You've got your 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 finger, you know, kind of on the on the pulse of the of what's happening in the sector, identifying some really great opportunities. So um, uh, I think that's that's really good. Um, to me, these seem like a, a mix of 
of really big potential uh, opportunities to improve the standards and each each coming with their their like you know little set of uh you know for snickety little difficult challenges to overcome <laughs> which is probably why their opportunities it, for improvement in the standards and they aren't already just baked into the standards um, because there's some challenges there and it's evolving so um you know one question that i i thought i would uh, ask about is you know the extent to which you sort of see this connecting back to human capital and and, and the work that Kelly um, already kind of previewed for us uh, earlier today and in, in that project. Yeah, thanks, Jeff, and that's a, a great question. Uh, definitely something that that we're actively considering and and trying to think about as as we go forward with this. And you know the the impact on the worker with the building, considering we spend you know upwards of ninety percent of our time inside. These structures uh, is is a, a something that we really need to consider, and I, and I think you know that really gets into as we move forward, uh, you know, with the the more uh, industry specific focus of that is that you know we may see this issue come out in other industries depending on the materiality of it. Um, you know, at this point, I, I you know can't really say if you know it makes sense for us to to do a broader a broader scope type project with this, but hopefully as we continue to to again dig into this and thinking about health and safety and, and other issues and, and the productivity element, the retention element that these buildings have uh, potentially on the workforce uh, is hopefully something that we, we consider with that industry specific lens. All right. Thanks, Will. Uh, Lloyd? Well, uh, maybe to build on that point, um, in terms of setting priorities, I'd be careful about stacked ranking these. These are just really important things um, against two significant sources of systemic risk, uh, climate change and human capital, both uh, the utilities and real estate sector are heavily impacting both of those. So I don't think it's optional to get involved and really assess um, what we can do here. And I, I think we should be thinking in terms of um, having these be fairly high priority projects. Um, people often uh, underestimate how impactful real estate is on the climate issue, but uh, New York City found a significant percentage of the city's carbon emissions were coming from the built environment, not just from vehicles or power generation. And the built environment is very stable. There's a lot of inertia. So refitting becomes extremely important. So having good disclosure from companies about what they're doing in these areas, I think is really important. And, and to the degree we want the standards to align with these sources of systemic risk. I, I just think it really raises the uh, the urgency on these issues, both of both or or these sectors, utilities and real estate. Thanks, Elaine. No, that's really helpful feedback. I appreciate that. Uh, the comments that you provided there. So the how to prioritize is a resounding yes. Yes. <laughs> from from Lloyd. <laughs> well, exactly. I'll, I'll... I'll be more of a curmudgeon, I guess. Uh, Lloyd sees a broader view than I do, but uh, I see each of these at a different state of maturity. Uh, I agree with Lloyd, they're all very important. Um, certainly the first one to me is the most substantial and the farthest developed, and it's us catching up with what the world is doing. So we're behind on this one now. You know, I was involved in the original one. And, you know, now that the globe, we're, we're, we've got to encompass and get our arms around the scope of things that are being done that today have a material impact and there are very thoughtful approaches country by country or state by state. And so to me that this is a huge contributor to climate and there's a lot of information out there. Um, as you move down, the issue of end use efficiency is a fascinating topic. Um, but it's really close to virgin territory as far as us surveying. And so I see this as one where I'd be, I doubt that we're gonna come up with anything dramatic quickly, but it would be wonderful to get more educated or more confused on a higher level anyway. <laughs> and then the healthy buildings and real estate, I think we've got a pretty good approach for the, for the, the energy usage anyway. So at least a big piece of this we've got there. Now, maybe we need to globalize to pull in some other standards. And, uh, you know, Brian, you, you're an expert on that. The only question is, is this movement towards, you know, fresh air and all the rest of that stable enough that it is a material factor? And it may be over time, there may be a little bit of an over movement here because of the freshness of the COVID. So 
I think we do have different decisions around three important topics. Number one, I think would be full bore ahead. I think we're behind the world. Uh, two is fascinating, but I, I wouldn't, I would hesitate to know what to do with it. And three, it's an issue of whether the environment is stable enough. So there's two so things. I, I just wanna be, be mindful of time. We're running right up against the, uh, the wire here. So uh, just quickly, if, um, if we could go to Elizabeth. Yeah, I just wanna add, the other consideration for me is like the, the the first two standards i think if i remember correctly are already out there and we're told that they don't fit and so and and we have people who are reporting against this topic so we already have people we can speak to about it and it's also really aligned with our um internationalization efforts to address those so I, that's how i think about prior prioritization as well that's it for me thanks elizabeth Brian, uh, anything else that you want to you want to add on this? Just a very quick comment and follow up to Kurt's uh, comments specifically on that second topic that was discussed. I want to be really careful that we don't interpret your feedback, Kurt, as to say that this is not an area to work on because we know that we have content, you know, specifically metrics in the standard right now um, that don't work um, in um, certain regions and cer certain uh, jur jurisdictions. And so um, I think that it's more around, I, I, I'm using maybe a little bit of my own uh, judgment here in interpreting your comments, Kurt, but it's not that this is not something that we should work on because we have a problem in terms of international applicability. It's more around designing the objectives to be more consistent with the concerns that you're ex expressing here. Um, so we, we don't need to uh, dive further. I, I just want to just really be clear that that there's content in the standard right now, some that we think is really strong and some that gets great feedback related to the, 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 the nature of this topic. And there's this very, very specific concern on the international applicability of, of, of the metric. I agree, Brian. You made me sound more coherent when you restated what I said. Thanks. Great. Thanks. I think not not for right now, but would really love to keep hearing from you, Lloyd, on that third topic that Will brought forward, especially. I mean, you know, talk, expert investor view um, and one that knows the real estate industry well. And so, um, you know, I think that that can be a good chance for some follow up conversations that can help Will out in uh, carrying this this work forward. So that's all for me. Thanks, Will and Jeff. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Oh, Jeff, please. Anything else, uh, Will, before we before we wrap? Just wanted to say uh, thanks so much for the, the feedback on that. That question there related to prioritization. Sounds like we'll be in touch and continue to talk about all three of these in the future. So looking forward to, to many more discussions around uh, these topics as we get a better uh, grasp on the landscape of these. Just wanted to highlight quickly next steps, uh, continue to uh, incorporate this feedback uh, and continue to uh, essentially research and consult on these and come back to the board with more information as we learn more and and uh, and peel back the layers of these onions a bit more here. So, uh, and then just wanted to provide contact information to any of the observers of today's meeting. If they'd like to get in touch about any of these issues, please feel free to send me an email here. So many thanks to the board for today's session. Great, thanks Will, uh, appreciate that. So we'll go ahead and uh, uh, just wrap up the session um, just to, to close the meeting, let me say uh, just a couple things. One, um, and we can go to the next slide. Uh, to, you know, today's session has been uh, recorded, and so will be available shortly on our on our on the SASB webpage under the calendar, uh, the board meeting calendar and archive. So uh, if you didn't catch all of today, or if you want to go back to anything that was said, you're welcome to go back there. Uh, and we've got our upcoming meetings in May and, and July um, uh, are the nearest term. So look forward to to hearing back from the team uh, on that. Um, Brian, was there anything that you wanted to add before we before we close for the day? Just a very quick comment. Appreciated the discussions with the board today on human capital, on the conceptual framework and rules of procedure, and on a few of these opportunities within the utilities and real estate industries. Um, calling back to David's comments at the beginning, uh, the board should expect to hear from staff in the very, very near future on the systemic risk project, uh, namely our, our proposed proposal around uh, exposure draft and basis for conclusions for a public comment period. And then um, sometime shortly thereafter, hearing from staff uh, on the raw materials uh, sourcing in apparel project and specifically looking for board the board's review and feedback 
on an exposure draft that's under development and the supporting basis for conclusions as we aim to move towards a public comment period for that project as well. So two kind of concrete actions the board should anticipate in the relatively near term. A lot more to come as we ta talked about throughout the meeting uh, throughout this year, but those are two uh, near term actions. Just again, thank you to Jeff and to the full board for the, the great discussions today. Thanks, Brian. Uh, and thanks to, to you and to David and, and to uh, the rest of the team, Kelly, Shivani, and Will, for, for everything that they did to prep for, for the meetings today. Great, uh, great content, great presentations, and uh, really appreciate all the work that the team does to, to help with what we're trying to accomplish here. So uh, thank you to everybody, to my fellow board members, and, uh, and again, a welcome to Suzanne and Mark you know, for their first public board meeting. Hopefully they enjoyed it. Um, and with that, we'll go ahead and, and close the meeting. So thank you for being here. Thank you.